Good morning, good morning, and I'll uh, call to order the uh, May 12th City Council meeting. Once again, we're doing things still a little differently. Uh, and uh, before we get started, I'm going to ask the Clerk of Council to do a roll call uh, so that we know, uh, know that everybody's here. Madam Clerk. Good morning. Mayor Pro Campbell. Council Barnes. I'm here. Councilor Crabb. Present. Councilor Davis. Present. Councilor Garrett. Present. Councilor Howard. Here. Councilor Huff. Here. Councilor Howard. Here. Councilor Thompson. Councilor Thompson. Councilor Thompson's having some issues getting in. I'm working with her now. Okay, thank you. Councilor Woodson. Councilor Woodson. Mr. Mayor, we currently have seven members present at this time. Okay, good. Well, we've got a quorum. We'll go ahead and and get started. Uh, before we uh, before we get to our business portion of the meeting. Uh, we'll start. Now, Councilor Thompson is not online at the moment, uh, so I'm going to ask uh, our Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Gary Allen, uh, if he would open us with a prayer. Is Councilor Allen on? Mr. Mayor, I was not showing Mayor Pro Tem. As being present as of yet. All right. Well, then I'll I'll um, I'll lead us in prayer. If you would bow your heads. Father God, we come to you this morning asking for your grace and your mercy, and and we thank you for for all that you do for us, and and we particularly pray for those that have lost loved ones during this pandemic. Uh, we ask that you be with all those families who are dealing with individuals who uh, are exhibiting symptoms. We ask that you you come into our midst this, uh, this morning to guide us and keep us ever mindful that what we do for your people, we do for you. Now, we ask your blessings on these proceedings, and, uh, and we thank you for, for all that you provide the citizens of this community. Amen. 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 All right. And now, if you would, uh, do you have a flag. I do have a flag. I'm in the office. So, uh, if you would... Uh, Valerie Stan Thompson is Stan now joining. We'll, we'll say a pledge of the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the Republic for which it stands. Some things just sound a little different without a bunch of young folks out there saying that pledge, you know. That's right. <laughs> uh, first off, uh, I would ask for approval of the minutes for the April 28th meeting. I'll move for approval of the minutes. Walker here. John Howe, second. Moved by Councillor Garrett and seconded by Councillor House. Any edits or discussions? All right. All those in order say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Is there any member, any member of council who opposes? All right. They are they are approved. A uh, couple couple of a uh, of, of announcements uh, I have on on my agenda, but I'm going to ask for assistance in going through a couple of them. Uh, one is oh, one of the Hey, one, hey. We, we need to get uh, those of you who are not speaking it, if you could uh, mute your phone and and or your your screen and that way if you have if you want to speak just we'll be able to see if you turn your turn your mic on. But I did want to make mention that we are going to be meeting in person at the Civic Center. Uh, on the 26th, it'll be uh, uh, carefully distanced and spaced as we meet. Uh, we'll probably set up on the floor. Uh, Mr. City Manager, are you are you available to give any additional information? Uh, 
Yes, sir. And uh, Mr. Mayor, we are scheduled to meet uh, the fourth Tuesday and Deputy City Manager Lisa Goodwin is uh, on in the meeting and uh, she has orchestrated that and I am going to yield to her to okay. tell us how that is going to work. Uh, thank you, Mr. City Manager, and good morning. Yes, on May the 26th, uh, we are scheduled to have our council meeting there at the Civic Center. Everything will be on the arena floor. Uh, we will have uh, council set up, as you would see it right now, uh, socially distanced apart. Each of the council will have their individual microphones, and uh, nothing will change in terms of how, uh, how it's conducted. Uh, we will have on the floor... Uh, also, space for citizens to come and be a part of that. Again, we will have socially distanced, the chairs will be set apart. Uh, we will also have a microphone in the center as we would uh, do in a, as a public meeting uh, so that those who wish to speak or those who are on public agenda will be able to come up and to speak. So yes, it's plenty of room on the floor uh, and, um, and everything will be set up for June the 20, uh, for May the 26th and of course the June 9th meeting as well. Well, Deputy City Manager, you've um, you've had your hands full in trying to orchestrate <laughs> some of these unusual ways to try to get us all together, and I appreciate all that you've done. Absolutely. Uh, but we will it will be good to get us all in the same room, even if uh, <laughs> it is from a distance. That's right, Mr. Right. Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Mayor, I have a question. Yes, <clears throat> Councilor Thomas, <clears throat> we have a budget. Uh, meeting scheduled for two o'clock that afternoon. Is that going to be at the Civic Center also? I, I think it it would it probably should be. Um, if I mean, uh, Mr. City Manager. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we will have the budget meeting immediately. Fall. Uh, excuse me. Prior to uh, the the, the 5:30 meeting, I was about to say immediately following, but I don't think we want to be there afterwards. But uh, Madam Budget Chair, um, unless you say otherwise, we will plan to hold that at the Civic Center just prior to the regular meeting. Uh, no, that's fine. As long as um, someone will get to the council and let us know exactly what we need to do to, to start that at 2 o'clock. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Um, I did want to give you a... Um, uh, kind of a brief little update on on COVID-19 as it as it impacts our community. Uh, our numbers, uh, I sound like a broken record, but they continue to go up a little bit. We're at 300. As of this morning, we were at 377 positive cases. Uh, we did, uh, unfortunately, add two more to our, our total of people that have passed away. We have 14 individuals that have lost their lives to the virus uh, who live in Muskogee County. Uh, our hospitalization rate continues to stay flat. In fact, it's actually uh, the, the number of folks uh, in, in the, our area hospitals has actually decreased over the last few days. So we continue to watch the trends. And we continue to try to make sure that, uh, that even though more testing is available and it is generating a little bit uh, higher numbers on our, on our positive tests, um, we, we are continuing to, to manage our hospital uh, folks who are continuing to manage their resources exceptionally well. Uh, so, so that's the number we're watching, and we're we're continuing to watch that. You know, the governor's got a uh, press conference coming up, and and uh, we we are anxious to hear what happens to his executive order, whether or not it stays or it it it, it expires, or maybe he substitutes another another order uh, in its place. But uh, whatever whatever route he goes, we'll be prepared to react. Um, we we are beginning to open some other facilities. The um, the city uh, offices, administrative offices, uh, are scheduled to be open on the 18th. And I'm gonna I'm gonna ask uh, Deputy City Manager Lisa Goodwin to, to speak on that in a moment. Uh, and you'll hear about some of the other facilities that are slowly being opened. And and we're doing it incrementally. And we're doing it by by watching the numbers because it's it's really a blend. I mean it's it's not all science and it's and, and it's and it's not all just by feel and trying to get the economy open uh, our goal is to try to get our quality of life back to where it was and get our economy back to where it was um, but we 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 know that that really there's no there's no perfect time there's not going to be a, 
there's not going to be a green light that flashes when all of a sudden everything is clear and we're able to open everything and get right back to normal. There's still going to be uh, urgings from our office, uh, just like from the CDC and DPH, to continue to socially distance. If there are activities that uh, are taking place and we, we cannot provide enough space for them to keep some, keep some distance uh, from one another, uh, then, then we're not going to open those facilities just yet. Uh, we've got some uh, of our parks and recreation uh, fields that um, it's just not time yet for those leagues and, and uh, organized uh, um, events to, to gear back up. There are contact sports, uh, basketball and, and soccer are contact sports. Uh, so it's just uh, for us, I think we need to really watch the trends on the numbers. And as we continue to gain a little bit more confidence as the numbers stay flat from a hospitalization perspective, uh, we will look at opening more. But I'm going to ask the city manager and deputy city manager to kind of give you some more detail uh, as to which uh, uh, functions of the government will be open and how that will take place. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, let me just, uh, and I'm going to ask deputy city manager Goodwin to speak to um, the operations as she is deputy city manager of day-to-day -day operations, but uh, wanted to say that, uh, as you've said, we are going to reopen uh, the public buildings on uh, Monday, May 18th, and I do want the mayor to know uh, and the council to know that uh, we are doing what we need to do to make sure that we protect our employees and protect citizens, and um, we're going to be sending out uh, today, in fact, a COVID-19 mask wearing policy uh, that will require uh, the employees to uh, wear masks uh, when face-to-face -face with other employees um, and or when face-to-face -face with citizens and conducting business. Uh, we want to make sure that our employees remain safe and we want to make sure that um, uh, the citizens uh, remain safe as they um, re-engage the, the, the government and public buildings and doing business with the uh, city. So that COVID-19 mask wearing policy will be uh, signed today. And we are going to strongly, strongly encourage uh, citizens um, coming into the public buildings uh, to wear masks. Uh, but we will have a policy for our employees regarding wearing masks. And so with that, we had a video that we had planned to show you today. And as technology goes, um, we had a corrupt file and we can't run that video this morning. So uh, I've asked Deputy City Manager Goodwin to quickly get those department heads who are on the video uh, to um, give a brief update to you in specific work areas. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Deputy City Manager Lisa Goodwin. Thank you so much, um, Mr. City Manager. And Mayor, as you have directed us, we will open our facilities back up on Monday, uh, May the 18th. Uh, that, of course, includes all of our buildings, the Government Center, the City Services Center, the Annex, and all other government buildings. Uh, we are doing so uh, with social distancing in mind in an effort that we are able to minimize the spread of COVID-19. Uh, as people enter many of our buildings, they will see the six-foot social distancing markers on the floors. They will see plexiglass uh, that shields at the counters, uh, more cleaning, more sanitizing taking place than <clears throat> ever before. We are also encouraging... Valerie Thompson. We're also now encouraging exiting. those that are entering public buildings uh, to wear a face mask for their protection and for the protection of others. You will also see employees wearing face masks when engaging with the public as they continue to live uh, our new normal. I will be followed by various departments that will be speaking and talking about getting things back open. Uh, public Works, uh, I will have uh, Kyle McGee and Sharnay Ware, Parks and Recreation, uh, Becky Glisson, Trade Center, uh, uh, Haley Tillery, Bull Creek and Oxbow, Jim Arden, Nancy Borden with Election and Registration, and Lula Huff 
uh, tax commissioner will be following. And they're going to share their strategies on getting things back open. I also serve as the interim director of the Civic Center, and the Civic Center will be open along with the ice rink again on May the 18th, but only the administrative offices of those facilities. So that means that our box office will be open. And so all of those events that were canceled, uh, if you had a purchased a ticket for any of those events, you will be able to come to the box office uh, to receive funds regarding those events uh, that were canceled as a result of COVID-19. At this time, we do not have a date specific that we will open either facility to large events or, or large gatherings. Uh, this information, of course, will be shared as we get closer to the end of the June 12th State of Emergency Declaration, at which time our mayor will provide direction on how we move forward. We are, however, preparing for the return of great entertainment and family fun uh, at the Columbus Civic Center and at the ice rink. And so we do look forward to that return and safe return for everyone. At this time, I will ask uh, Charnay Ware or Kyle McGee with Public Works to follow me to come and discuss uh, the events of uh, Public Works, the recycling and other efforts that we have planned. Uh, thank you, Deputy City Manager Goodwin, and good morning, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, as part of Public Works Solid Waste and Recycling Collection, I'm very pleased to announce that we are currently caught up with yard waste and household garbage collection um, items. Our staff has worked tirelessly through this pandemic and they've stuck with us and sacrificed and we are glad that we're caught up. So now it's next steps. Everybody wants to know when is recycling going to be in reinstated and my answer is as soon as we can possibly do it. Our goal right now is to reinstate recycling June the 1st with very strict um, we're taking measures to get our staff and, and inmates separated as much as possible, uh, decked out with all the PPE they need. And we, we, will, we will try to do this June the 1st. And we may have to uh, slow the line down a little bit to accommodate the amount of uh, material that we can sort. But uh, I think that's the sacrifice that we're willing to make. And, um, and the question is, why haven't you slowed the line down? Well, the answer is, under normal circumstances, we have more material than we can process. We've got to keep that line going as fast as we can. So we didn't want to do that for extended period of time. So if we start June the 1st and we have to slow it down, no, some items may end up in the landfill that we cannot process, but at least we can start back processing recyclables. So that's where we are. Our goal is June the 1st. We're, we're trying to make that happen. And before June the 1st, we're, in the next couple of weeks, we are going to try to implement drop-off sites. Um, we have five, five drop-off sites throughout Muskogee County. Um, and we would like to implement them as a source separated collection only. For instance, if you have a, a stockpile of cardboard that is separated, it's not commingled, you will be able to take that to that drop off site. If you have aluminum, you know, we would have a bin for that. The issue right now is we are not separating recyclables on our sorting line because. Um, we can't maintain that social distance in between workers. So we plan on June the 1st to spread those workers out, put barriers in between them, slow the line down if possible, and we get some material sorted and through that line. Because I know Columbus is ready to get back to recycling, as are we. Okay, and so what that means is <clears throat> Uh, citizens will be able to begin putting their recycles back out on the curb for pickup. So uh, I know Kyle has said we're, 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 we're going to try and to make it happen. We're going to make it happen uh, June the 1st. So be prepared to place your recyclables on the curb and we will begin um, the recycling efforts again. Lisa, 
Yes, this is Charmaine Crab. I have a question for Kyle. Do you have the locations that you were speaking of, the drop-off locations? I don't and have them. They, be open? they should be on our website, um, Councilor Crab. I can get those for you guys. I know one of them's at Cooper Creek. One of them's at Will Smith Road or Williams Road exit. But let me get a list of those. They should be on our website. There are they would be our normal drop-off sites. Okay. One is at Sacerdote Lane. One is at Victory Drive at the old recycle center. So um, let me get that. One, the Welcome Center, center at uh, off Williams Williams Road. Okay. Right. And and in front of the recycling center itself on the road. Okay, so that's number five. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Any other questions of Kyle or Pat? Thank you both. Next, we will hear from uh, Becky Glisson with Parks and Recreation. Um, good morning, councilors and mayor. Um, I'll try to be as brief as possible with our large list. Our offices, our administrative offices will open Monday uh, with a staggered staff. Some still work, teleworking from home due to the closeness of the office, but we will be available for the citizens starting Monday. Our senior centers will not be able to be opened before the June 12th date due to the governor's must-stay order. Uh, our recreation centers fall in that same category. They will not be able to be open at least until the June 12th date. We are planning a soft opening, if you will, for Lake Oliver Marina starting Monday. Citizens will be able to get gas, uh, bait and tackle. They'll be able to launch their boats. They'll be able to get concession items. The only thing that we will not be offering at this time will be um, our lunch service, which, as everybody knows, is pretty popular. We have large crowds for that. So we will put that off until at least the June 12th date so there's no mingling or closeness within the building itself. Due to the nature of uh, boxing, our Hey Good Boxing Gym will remain closed until at least June 12th. We also are planning a soft opening for Cooper Creek Tennis Center starting Monday. Uh, we will ensure social distancing, no double play. We're going to try to skip every other court. We have plans for checking in at the clubhouse where the players don't have to come into the clubhouse. Tennis balls will be marked with names for safety reasons. We have different plans in place for that that the players will be told uh, upon coming to the center. Britt David Pottery Studio will not be able to be open until at least the June 12th date. Jonathan Hatcher Skateboard Park will not be able to be open until at least the June 12th date due to the volume of users there. All of our athletic fields, as the mayor mentioned, um, Little League, Adult Leagues, will be closed until at least the June 12th date. Woodruff Farm Soccer Complex, as soccer is a contact sport, this facility will stay closed until at least the June 12th date. Our disc golf courses are currently open now, and they will stay that way. Our parks are open for the citizens to enjoy the trails, walking, jogging, running, bicycling. However, our playgrounds and pavilions will stay closed until at least the June 12th date. Our, our restrooms will remain open. The Ma Rainey House, we will open it up Monday morning uh, to start tours. Uh, we'll have to take less than five people in each tour, and we just ask the citizens to, to hopefully call ahead and schedule this so we can be prepared for those. The Columbus Aquatic Center and our outdoor pools will our Columbus Aquatic Center will remain closed through June 12th. Uh, we will further evaluate at that time with the Department of Public Health. Um, our outdoor pools, we would like to say that we would wait till June 12th to make that decision. However, we, we pretty much think that those might have to stay closed for the entire summer. And our summer camps right now, um, we have no word on those until we get closer to the June 12th um, date to see if we will be able to offer summer camp. Our therapeutic recreation division at Pop Austin Rec Center, due to this population, this program will continue to be closed until at least the June 12th date. And that's it for me. Becky, thank you. Are there any questions of Becky? 
Becky, you might want to mention that one of the primary reasons that the pools are, are looking likely to be closed this summer is due to employment issues. Yeah, yes, sir. Um, we typically employ um, high school and freshly uh, new college students for our outdoor pools. And at this particular time, we have not received a lot of feedback um, that we will be able to retain any employees. Uh, parents mostly are scared for these children of this age to come back to work. Um, we feel like that due to that, it's going to be impossible to, to staff the two outdoor pools. We are still trying at this moment, but due to that and some health department regulations and, and different things, the outdoor pools may have to stay closed this season. Thank you. Any additional questions? Okay. Hearing none, I'm going to ask Jim Arton with Bull Creek and Oxbow Golf Courses uh, to provide his update. Yes, the, um, the golf courses have been open. It's been uh, very popular with the citizens of Columbus. Um, there's been a lot of demand. And uh, what we have done is we followed the, the city guidelines as well as uh, PGA recommended guidelines to operate safely. Um, so we've done that with with a, a lot of signage. Anybody that hasn't opened, I would I would uh, urge you to have more signage than you think you need because it's um, you know it re it requires a lot of, of informing. Uh, but of course we're we're distancing. We're telling them that we're distancing the people that are coming. We have markings on the floor in the clubhouse. And we're using wooden stakes for spacing outside the door because we're only allowing three people in the clubhouse at a time. So when we're busy, we do have um, people lining up outside. Uh, and the, you know, if we're doing six feet plus. Uh, we actually have a, a large, large area in the clubhouse, uh, larger than six feet. Um, additional signage in the in the clubhouse as well, uh, reminding them that there's only three people. And um, we have plexiglass at the at both uh, point of sale. Uh, systems uh, at the counter to separate the members from the uh, from the clerks. We have one entry and one exit only, so we keep um, we keep the doors open to keep um, air flowing, which is a recommendation, and uh, that way people are not passing each other. They're one way in, one way out. Uh, we're constantly sanitizing everything, um, whether it's the the counter the doors, the bathrooms, uh, there's one bathroom open, um, but we're constantly wiping down and spraying. And of course the golf carts uh, has touch points. So we have one rider per golf cart and we are, we're constantly uh, sanitizing them to make sure that anything that would be likely touched uh, has been uh, properly sanitized before it goes out to the golfers. Um, as far as the play on the course goes, uh, we're, we're telling people they're not allowed to touch the flag sticks. And we also have foam in the bottom of the cup so that the ball doesn't go so far down that they would have to touch the flag stick to get the ball out. Uh, so that's been received very well. Uh, we've taken the rakes off of the golf course so that um, there's no touch point there. We're just asking them just to smooth the sand with their feet. That's all been uh, received very well. Our food and beverage area the uh, our grill we've closed that operation however we have been able to provide on course service uh, and when we do that you know the servers are wearing masks and they have uh, hand sanitizer available uh, well both for the for the employee and for the customers and then uh, another thing that we have done is we have uh, we've really made a push for online reservations so that uh, people don't have to necessarily do it here in the clubhouse they're able to uh, book their reservations online uh, and just, you know, reducing uh, the interaction and the, and the need to touch. So uh, those, those are the things that, uh, that we've put into practice here at the golf courses, and it's working quite well. We've been very busy. Mr. Mayor, I have a question. This is Mimi or Lisa. I have a question. Okay. When, um, thank you very much for that report. Appreciate it. When they're serving food, are they taking the food outside or are they in that area where it, it's kind of like a dining area? Are they being six feet apart there? How are they doing the food? Jim? 
Yes. So the only the only food that is being served would be prepackaged food. So we're not preparing any food. Our restaurant is closed. So it's prepackaged food. It would be you know a bag of chips or crackers, something like that. It's just um, or we, we we may make some uh, sandwiches, but it's all uh, prepared and served outside. So they're eating it as they're going around the golf course. There's there's no uh, dining area. Okay. Well, thank you, Jim. And I apologize. I took a senior moment with your name. Sorry. But thank That's you. Right. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's all I have, Lisa. Okay. Thank you. Jim, thank you so much for that report. Next, I'll call on uh, uh, Hill, uh, Haley Tillery with the Trade Center to give her update. Haley? Hello, everyone, and good morning. Um, the Trade Center has been taking a lot of um, precautionary measures in preparation for opening Monday. Um, the biggest thing on Monday is to realize our building will be open, but we still will not have events taking place that week. Um, all throughout the month of May, for all of our clients, we've reached out to them, and even future clients, we have virtual meeting options where we're giving them virtual tours. We're walking them through the building. We actually, with our social um, tables diagram software, we can virtually plan a client's entire diagram um, from computer to computer. So we've communicated that to the clients and have been working very uh, well with that. In fact, clients have really enjoyed this measure so far. Um, as far as our front desk, we're already in an enclosed glass type box, um, if you're familiar with the admin um, office. So for our front desk receptionist, we're only going to have one person, one customer in that room at any time. And there will be signage that will list that, as well as sitting area outside of the front area where people can socially distance if there ends up being a line. But honestly, all of our appointments right now have been set up virtually, and this will just be if we had a walk-in client that came in who had not prior organized anything. Um, the entire building has been sanitized from top to bottom over the past couple months, and we develop a new opening and closing sanitation checklist that takes place every single day. Um, this will also take place when events start reopening. In addition to that, um, one thing I want to briefly talk about the Trade Center has adopted a three-phase reopening process, and this has been communicated um, with our clients. We have all of our clients um, required to do event insurance, as well as signing an addendum to their contract that also shows them what their responsibilities are as a client. Um, this is a group and team effort when clients are having events. So, they are aware of what measures that they need to take and what they need to communicate to their attendees when coming to their events. For instance, all tables in the future will always be seven feet apart from one another. The standard in the past was five, but we're going to have tables at seven. Um, during this three-phase reopening process, when June 1st comes around, the Trade Center will be in phase two at that time if everything is going as planned from phase one. This will mean it will be four weeks of declining cases percentage-wise, and this will also be still recommendations on what the mayor and what the state orders are as far as when it comes to vulnerable individuals that we talked about. Um, we can. It's still going to be avoid any socializing in groups more than 50 that cannot socially distance. So the events that we have lined up in June, we have come up with a certain plan for each event on how those events can still take place while social distancing. Now, if the client has decided they don't want to follow those protocol and they want to wait to where the, some of the guidelines are lessened throughout the months going forward, they have that option. We do have our first event on June 6th, and that event has been completely modified to social distancing guidelines. Um, with things dealing with food, we've been working with our um, partner and vendor Spectra Ovations. There will be no buffet stations. Everything will be plated. There will be nothing preset on the tables. Um, that's just, I'm giving you the big scope um, or, or the little scope from a big scope that we've been working on just to give you an idea. Um, in addition to that, all of our employees know the, um, they are going to be required when they're on the floor to be wearing their mask. We will have sanitizer stations 
all throughout the facility now. Um, before you leave a bathroom, there will be a hand sanitizer right by the door. Um, before you enter any type of event space, there will be a hand sanitizer station. When you come into the building, all the main entrance, there will be a hand sanitizer station. We also will have different indication signage on all of our doors that will remind people if you've been sick, if you have been around somebody that has been sick, we ask that you do not come in the building. Um, one thing that we're working on right now, um, I have found that people respond well and they remember acronyms. So one thing we're going to have is come back SMART Columbus for your event. SMART is the acronym where S stands for shield your cough and sneezes. M is mask your face in public. A is apart, meaning remember to social distance. R is rinse, con constantly wash and sanitize. And T, tidy, keep your areas clean. Um, so wherever you're at, there's an image that matches each acronym. That image logo will be where it needed to be. For instance, in the bathroom, you might see that social distance logo in the bathrooms to indicate if you walk in and there's a line, we have 16 other bathrooms you can go to. So there's going to be signage everywhere. Um, I know it's, June 6th is going to really be an opportunity for us to test this method, and it's a small event, so I feel comfortable with that. Um, but each, each week that we go by will get us closer to phase three, Phase three begins on July 1st. And again, that's if, if everything's been going as planned in phase one and phase two. Phase three will still be strict modifications, but it will almost be what the new norm is going to be mo moving forward. We know that this, this whole F, um, pandemic is going to be new habits that are not going to go away. So that's going to be the guidelines for events moving forward as well. The addendum has really helped with our clients understanding what their responsibilities are. In addition to everything else, um, I feel like this is going to be a great plan to get us back on track, to get us acting as normal as possible, but also with the number one priority to remain safe and healthy. Um, if you're interested in knowing what this three-phase plan looks like, you can always go to columbustracecenter.com. And in the About section, we will have everything mapped out on there, including a document that you can download for each phase. Um, again, not to take up too much of your time, but uh, that is the small breakdown over a big scope of research and planning that we feel is going to be a safe environment for our citizens that will be walking in our building. Haley, thank you so much for that report. Great report. Council um, Yes, um, Haley, you were speaking about the insurance. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Because you said yeah. the customer. So just want to get a better understanding on that portion. Please. No, absolutely. So currently in all of our lease agreements, we require a liability insurance for the client. This is a standard protocol. But I'm going to be honest with you. For most of our clients with one-day events, it has not been as mandated as it should be. So with this moving forward, we're just going to be making sure that every client has a copy of liability insurance that they're giving us. The addendum also expressed the importance of their insurance to have a pandemic clause in there. Um, we've worked with several insurance um, agencies throughout Columbus, so we could give the client the opportunity if they wanted to call one of those clients to take off some of that burden and pressure and to keep the cost low. So they could call one of those clients that we that know what we're requiring to kind of loosen that burden. There's also ways they can acquire this online, but to give you an example, a gathering of 100 to 150 people, event insurance is close to $100 more. So that's the expense that a client is paying for them to be safe, as well as for our employees and the way we perform our jobs to be safe. So in other words, if I was to have a wedding and it was um – 150 people, uh, you'll give me a list of different insurance companies and I will call them to get an insurance policy for the event. You would. Now, realize, though, that would be your choice to call one of those insurance. You can still call whoever you want and set up your own insurance. These are just people that already know what we're looking for as a courtesy to help you not have to explain things as much but you could still choose anybody as long as we have that certified copy of liability insurance, as well as you signing our addendum. Our addendum 
just breaks down whatever phase your event is in, whether it's phase one, two, or three, and what those requirements are during that phase for you and your attendees to follow. Okay, can I make a suggestion? Um, you said that the outline of the phases are in the, on your website. Could you also add an example like we just talked about, like for a wedding or something like that? Um, like, I think the Kiwanis have their event, you know, there, you know, once a month. Give a, a one or two examples of what it would look like, you know, your contract for with, adding the insurance so that people can get a an idea more or less because hearing that it puts a little fright in someone that's listening would say mm, do i want to really rent there now i got to go buy insurance to do this event maybe i need to go somewhere else but i think if there's something that explains it and an example on your website will ease up people that even even are not watching this now, but hear about it. Because, you know, perception becomes a reality. Absolutely. So it gives them a chance to go and see what we had just discussed. Absolutely. And what you just mentioned is something we thought about. We've, we've been doing that more one-on-one -on -one with our current clients. Mm -hmm. But, yes, for our future clients not to be deterred away from having an event here, um, we can definitely use that language that we've been using. It's, all it is is not to provide fright but add peace of mind and reassurance that you're going to be in a safe environment. Yes, ma'am. And thank you. And again, like I said, it's a suggestion because I'm pretty sure as people listen, people talk and it gets turned all around and then people might say, well, I don't want to go have my event there. But if they can go online and look on their own free will, then it'll make it a lot easier. Absolutely. Thank no, thank you. Okay. Any additional questions of Haley? Hearing none, Haley, thank you so much for that great report. We appreciate that. Okay, next we will hear from Nancy Boren, uh, Election and Registrations Office. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes. ma'am. Good morning. Okay. okay, good morning. Yes. We will be open for early voting beginning Monday, May the 18th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. We'll be open that Monday through Friday. We've pretty, pretty much kept our same hours that we do normally for early voting. The only thing we've eliminated is the Sunday and Monday, the Sunday before Memorial Day, and then the Monday of Memorial Day. But we will be open Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and the weekends from 9 to 4, just as we always have. We will also be practicing the social distancing. We will require voters to practice social distancing. Our workers will have protective um, uh, shields in front of them to their sneeze guards. They'll also have masks and gloves available. Equipment will be sanitized after every person votes. And we've already issued over 15,000 absentee ballots. We're issuing about 1,000 a day. So we anticipate having a really great um, turnout or, or number of people who vote in this election. Um, our workers here have uh, masks. We have sanitizing solution that we have purchased from Swamp Box Distillery, and we are using that as well as gloves and all other social distancing issues. We are expanded beyond our bounds. Um, we've had to borrow space to accommodate equipment and paperwork and, and ballots. And so we are continuing to look for additional space and ways to manage the equipment that we have. Okay, Nancy, thank you. Are there any questions of Nancy? Okay, Nancy, hearing none, thank you so much for that great report. We appreciate thank that. You. Uh -huh. uh, next, we will hear from our tax commissioner, Lula Huff. Ms. Huff? Okay. She may not be on the line. Okay. That ends the report of all of the departments and um, uh, how easing into the opening of our May 18th date. So if there are no further questions, that ends the report. Uh, Deputy City Manager Lisa Goodwin, this is Councillor Huff. 
Hello, how are you, Councilor Huff? I just wanted us to extend congratulatory remarks to Director Boren. You had a daughter to graduate recently. Congratulations. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Huff. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. I mean, it's, you know, the, the crazy thing is, I, I think the council would all agree. Um, there's no roadmap for this. There's never been a situation that we've had to deal with quite like the one we're navigating and, and like all cities are uh, around the globe, really. Um, but I, I, I just won't tell you that, that I really feel like our folks under your leadership have done just a fantastic job of looking at every opportunity to try to get our governmental properties back in action as soon as it's safely and practically possible. Uh, we, it's fluid. We keep watching it. Uh, right. as, as you heard, I know I've received a lot of calls from uh, parents of, of little leaguers, uh, and we want them to get on the field. We really do. But we want them to do so safely, and we want them to do so in a, in a manner that is safe for the grandparents to come watch and not make it a, uh, you know, not make it a situation where they, uh, they feel awkward in an environment that may uh, harm their health. So thank you so much for that. We will get that uh, video up, correct? Yes, we are. Yeah, we'll be working on that. Had a little glitch here and there, but we're working to pull all of that together so that we can post it on social media and other sites so that we can, it's a continuous flow of information. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and to that end, we're actually going to host a, a, a live town hall, a virtual town hall meeting uh, Thursday of this week at uh, 530. And we'll be taking questions from the public. We've already been begun collecting them, uh, and uh, and we'll try to make sure that we get the information out that that our citizens are interested in hearing. And also along the lines of the, of this being such an unusual and unique um, situation, and how how much uncertainty is around. I remember when I, uh, the, the first address I, I gave as as mayor was uh, a little over a year ago, and I, I indicated I was going to ask council to support a one cent sales tax and uh, and and council did uh, well just you've seen how we are struggling madam budget chair uh, judy thomas is is, uh, is is working very very diligently on trying to craft this budget that we've we've dropped in the lap of council uh, and it's 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 difficult because there is so much uncertainty uh, and uh, if, if governments don't know where and where their revenues are going to fall and a lot of families don't either. There's a lot of families that are doing doing fine, but they still are uncertain about what the future holds with regards to the, the overall economy. And then there are other families that are really hurt. They've either lost jobs or they they, they operate small businesses that are hanging on by, by a thread. Uh, so because of that, uh, and I have spoken with most, if not all, of the counselors, and I, and I believe they support this, uh, we are going to, I'm asking council to approve a resolution to postpone our request for a SPLOST. Uh, with all the uncertainty in 2020, we just don't need to add one more, one more burden uh, to our, to our, uh, our, our, our community. Uh, so we are, but, but this is not an abandonment. This is just a delay. Uh, we expect our economy to get back on track very, very quickly. In fact, I'm not normally overly optimistic about, about finances. I tend to be a little more conservative. Uh, but I really think that Columbus, because of all the momentum we had going into this situation, we're going to see it come out very quickly. But it is going to take a little time. So, so there is a resolution uh, on, the, uh, on the agenda today that is going to ask council to support delaying the SPLOST vote until November of 2021. So I just wanted to mention that that as well. All right, with that, uh, we'll move to the city attorney's agenda. Mr. City Attorney. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Mr. Mayor, I- Oh, I'm uh, sorry, Mr. City Manager, you had something you wanted pulled up, didn't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, I'll turn it over to you. We, I'd, I'd like to pull up uh, um, the city attorney's uh, uh, appointment of a, of a new community reinvestment director. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I believe that uh, my candidate, uh, Mr. Robert Rob Scott, uh, is um, going to join this meeting uh, as I um, present to you for confirmation, uh, Mr. Robert um, Scott, uh, as my candidate. But Mayor and Council, I am pleased to 
uh, bring forward Mr. Robert Rob Scott as my choice to fill the position Director of Community Reinvestment and Real Estate. Uh, Mr. Scott uh, has joined us uh, this morning, uh, at least I hope he's there, uh, via Microsoft Teams. Uh, if confirmed, uh, Mr. Scott will be the first confirmation using this format. Uh, Mr. Scott is being recommended based on a proven record of performance. Uh, he comes with more than seven years of experience in housing and urban development grant management. Uh, he has a rich history of developing communities, creating affordable housing opportunities, and working to eradicate homelessness. Uh, since 2015, uh, he has served as a senior programs specialist for Gwinnett County's Community Development Office. Uh, during this time, he has successfully managed more than 83 home investment partnership projects by utilizing more than $13.7 million to acquire and rehabilitate homes to low income and first time home buyers in pursuit of the home ownership dream. Rob is well versed in the affordable housing arena. In addition to being well versed in the affordable housing arena, uh, Rob has tremendous experience building systems to address community homelessness through homelessness prevention emergency shelter, and rapid rehousing. Under Rob's leadership, Gwinnett County saw significant increases in client exits to permanent housing destinations, as well as decreases in homelessness recidivism. Rob's uh, knowledge, background, and experience in community development block grant and home programs will provide for a good transition for the City of Columbus. He comes highly recommended by my selection committee composed of Deputy City Managers Pam Hodge and Lisa Goodwin, uh, Finance Director Angelica Alexander, and our Human Resources Director Aretha Hollowell. I believe Rob will be a good fit for the Columbus community. Um, he was born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, he's a graduate of Clayton State University, where he earned a bachelor's degree in organizational leadership. Uh, he has been married to his wife, Tanya Scott, for 14 years. Uh, Rob and Tanya have three children and, grandchildren, and a grandchild. Uh, so, Mayor and Council, I'm confident that Rob will provide the continuity, stability, progress, and improvement uh, we need in our community reinvestment and real estate department. Uh, I am proud to present for confirmation for the position Director of Community Reinvestment and Real Estate Mr. Robert Rob Scott, uh, and he'll start at an annual salary of $89,804.28, and we expect him to start, if confirmed, around the 1st of June. And so, Mayor and Council, I ask for your confirmation. Councilor Hoffman, move for approval. Councilor, you're second. Councilor, uh, second. All right, there, there was a motion. It was a motion by Councillor Huff, and then I heard Councillor House with the second. Uh, any discussion on the motion to confirm? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any council members opposed? Mr. Scott, congratulations. Welcome aboard. We look forward to working with you. And Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Mr. Scott, I don't know if you can, if you're on video or just on the phone, but um, you're, we welcome you. And uh, do you have a statement or something you want to say at this time? <clears throat> Absolutely. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Sir. yes. Awesome. Awesome. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, City Council members and uh, City Manager Hughley. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to say that I'm honored to receive this confirmation. Um, I'm looking forward to working with um, City Manager Hughley and his team and Ms. Hodge. I wanted to take this time also to um, inform you that I intend to work to understand the needs of your respective communities. Um, and I'm going to work very hard to implement solutions that provide positive visibility with significant outcomes. Um, that continue to make the city a great place to live, work, play, and do business. Once again, thank you so much for, for um, um, your appointment, and I'm going to work to, to make you all proud. 
Thank you, Mr. Scott. And uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, I want to welcome him with a hand clap of welcome, if you will. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm honored. These, are, these are unusual times. Normally, we would take an opportunity to shake your hand and welcome you and slap you on the back. We'll save that up, though, when, when all this passes and we'll go through that. But we're excited to have you on board. Uh, it's an area that we are really heavily focused on uh, in trying to improve our community, and we look forward to working with you. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Any comments from any counselors? All right, Mr. Scott. Huh? Mr. Mr. Mayor, oh, yeah. I did just want to go back for the record to state that all 10 members of council are present. Okay, good. Thank you. So it is unanimous. Mr. Huff? Uh, Mr. Huff here. Uh, let me put my camera on so here I have some idea who I am. <laughs> good morning. Congratulations to you. We look forward to working with you. Uh, and I've, I've been through that county quite a few times, and you all have done a great job up there. I hope to bring some of the wisdom and the excitement to Columbus, Georgia. Uh, congratulations again to you and your family, and we welcome them, and we will uh, welcome you with open arms, and we look forward to meeting you in person very soon. Thank you so much for that. I'm excited, and I promise you I'm going to bring everything that I've learned uh, throughout my, the course of my work history here to, to help continue to uh, build the community. Thank you so much again for your kind words. Thank you. All right. Rob, I just want to yes. say um, welcome to Columbus and just want to give you a heads up. I'll be calling you at all hours and send you a text from the road when I'm on the street. Uh, John can testify <laughs> from that. Your phone will get pictures and a little message and at your earliest convenience. So. Welcome, but just wanted to give you a heads up. Your phone will be busy by me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mrs. Woodson. It's so funny. I already wrote your name down on my paper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so they told you about me, huh? Okay. Nope, just my keen perception. That's it. <laughs> well, keep that in mind because I have a project already for you. All right, we'll sit down Thank and talk. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, Mr. Scott, welcome. We look forward to uh, we look forward to good things. Thank you Thanks so much, sir. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Uh, City Attorney. It's your agenda. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everybody. Uh, again, congratulations, Mr. Scott. Uh, Mayor, we've got a few formal resolutions on the business agenda for council to consider today. The first one up is uh, related to municipal court. The chief justice of the Georgia Supreme Court, Harold Melton, has extended the judicial statewide emergency through June 12th. This resolution would allow municipal court to use the Columbus Civic Center and the Trade Center after that date from June 13th until September 15th as needed to try to ease the flow of people coming into the government center. This is a request of Municipal Court Judge Stephen Smith, and it is ready for adoption. Councilor Garrett, for approval. Second. Councilor Garrett, for approval. I have a question. Okay. Is there... I see that they're talking about municipal court, but what about magistrate court? Um, that'll be either uh, they'll handle that through the same personnel or magistrate court, which has a lower flow normally of people. They may still operate out of the government center. That'll be up to Judge Smith, but he will... Uh, you know, let the public know how that's going to work. And that's all going to start around June, June 13th? Correct. Okay. Is that all on that? Okay. 
Did we get a vote on that, Ms. Clark? Mayor, you're muted. No, we did not. No, we did not. All right, Mayor, we need a vote. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just held one and was surprised nobody answered until I saw I was still muted. Um, all right, any other questions? <laughs> it's been mo motion to second. All in favor say aye. 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 Worked better that time. Any, any council opposed? All right, it's approved. Okay, that passes. Next item, Mayor, you have already mentioned, but this is a motion, motion to motion. approve to delay, delay the, the uh, slots to November 2021. Second. I'll second. Second, Mimi. All right, this there's a motion by Council the, uh, This would delay second, the special Mimi. election until November 2nd, 2021. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when I have talked with people in the community about um, delaying this slot vote, the first question I get is, so what are we going to do about the government center in the meantime? Would you speak to that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for asking. We are actually going to move ahead with the government center plan, and that's one of the reasons this was a delay as opposed to an abandonment. Uh, we, we understand and we take very seriously, as all of you do, that, uh, that we made a commitment to the citizens to try to give them a safe environment to come conduct government business. Uh, this gives us some time to, to more thoroughly vet uh, some of the options that are out there. And uh, we're going to continue to move forward, though. We intend to have everything we can get done done prior to uh, to the vote coming around uh, next November. So there won't be any won't be any grass growing under our feet. We're going to continue to work towards a a solution. And if there um, are um, issues with the government, hey, then I need some help from me. As we've I'm seen in the past, it, we'll just have to take care of those as we have. Um, that's why we're continuing to move. And we really don't think we're going to lose a lot of time because all of the things that we're going to do during this uh, short delay, we would have been working on anyway. And that is making sure that council feels comfortable with, with the, the, the option that we choose, make sure they feel comfortable with the location, whether it's in its present location or we choose another one. So all of that would be going anywhere, uh, going in, in process anyway. So, so we would have had to deal with those, knock on wood, if they happen, and uh, and 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 we will will continue to do so as we move towards a a, a SPLOS vote in 2021. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Budget Chair. All right. Did we get a vote on that, Ms. Clark? No, sir. We did not call the vote. Okay. All those, there's no, any other uh, discussion or questions? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Any counselor opposed to that? Okay. That passes unanimously. All right. The last item we've got listed, Mayor, would ask the Georgia local, our local legislative delegation to the Georgia General Assembly to amend the Open Meetings Act to allow local government entities such as the Columbus Council to hold meetings via teleconference or other digital means on the same balance as state agencies. Second, Mimi. All right, there's a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any council opposed? That passes unanimously. All right. That has passed. Mayor, that's all we had listed formally. I want to give another shout out. Congratulations to Chief and Nancy Boren's Bulldog graduate. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, absolutely. We all share their excitement. Uh, they just got a pay raise, I guess, when they have a child graduate. Is that right? <laughs> all right. Well, good. Um, any, any questions for the city attorney before we move on? All right, next up is the public agenda. Uh, and our first, uh, our, our first individual is Ms. Teresa Elamin. Ms. Elamin, are you uh, on? Jer Jeremy, are you trying to get her connected? I, I just admitted her, so we might need to shout out one more time. 
All right. Uh, the, the, Miss Elamine, are you, are you, uh, can you hear us? I'm here. Oh, well, great. Well, listen, you, you have the, I guess the honor or the, uh, or maybe it's not the honor, being the first individual to appear before council, uh, virtually. And what we'll do is we'll do it just like we do in the, in the meeting. If you will, uh, state your name and your address. And then as soon as you begin your remarks, I've got a timer here that I'll begin, and then we'll let you know when your five minutes are up. Oh, okay, because I, I, I was trying to set up my own timer here so I could <laughs> make sure, because I don't right. see a timer. Normally at the council meeting, there's a timer that you can see, but I, you don't appear you, to have that here. Would you like me to give you a one-minute notice? Uh, well, let me try to add my timer. All right, good deal. I'll let okay. you get started. All right, well, again, your name and address, and then I'll hit the start on the button. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Teresa, uh, Teresa Elamin uh, with the Southern Anti-Racism Network, and the address is 3911 Steam Mill Road. And I, I do want to start out, Mr. Mayor, uh, by congratulating Mr. Scott and I look forward to meeting with him so we can talk about the deep poverty uh, that we have in Columbus and how his role may be able to contribute to that. And uh, Mr. Scott, you're joining uh, the wonderful staff of the Columbus Consolidated Government at a time when we have quite a few battles uh, going on in the community not the least of which is trying to stay safe from the COVID-19. And Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you uh, for the excellent job you're doing in keeping us informed under COVID-19. Uh, I, I went in that very long line on Saturday at the Shirley B. Winston Park. It was hundreds of people in our cars. And so I was tested on Saturday. So I'm waiting for the results. So I'm quarantined until then. Uh, but um, I do want to say to Mr. Scott uh, that I do apologize for uh, what needs to be said today. Uh, Columbus prides itself on being the first uh, consolidated government in the state of Georgia in 1971. Well, that was right about the time that I was engaged in the civil rights movement, and we were saying black power. That meant black political power, Mr. Mayor. And consolidated governments are known to dilute black political power. That's why Atlanta will never do it, because they're going to county commission, and they want a city government, and they be majority black in both places. In Durham, North Carolina, where I came from, same thing. It's Durham County, and it's the city of Durham. But during that period, when all the black people around the South were fighting for their voting rights and going forward on the voting rights, Columbus, Georgia, founded during slavery in 1828 or something like that, Columbus, Georgia, decided it would consolidate. And that legacy of consolidation and the legacy of slavery has brought us to the point where we are now. My subject is the Liberty District, and specifically the Liberty Theater. I have called for reparations, Mr. Scott, uh, from the city of Columbus, this consolidated government, which maintains a number of Confederate monuments that are maintained by the city. This is something that is a, a legal question for the black majority here in Columbus, Mr. Mayor. And I want to revisit that meeting from April 28th. That was a scandal. Mr. Mayor, when you first said that you were going to let Isaiah Hughley go, you may recall I sent you an email saying, what did you mean by that? Because I thought it was you were abdicating your role as mayor. 
And I know what I've been watching for nine years from Mr. Isaiah Hughley, city manager. When he presented that proposal from Mr. Smiley on April 28th, he should have known that he did not have the votes. Everybody in Columbus knows it takes six votes to win anything. And you have a white majority on the city council, Ms. Crabb, Mr. House, Mr. Garrett, Mr. Allen, Mr. Davis, Ms. Thomas, and you, Mr. Mayor. So I know that when you consolidate governments and you draw the lines to maintain a white majority, even though this is a black majority town, I think the citizens have to understand the politics of this fight at the Liberty Theater. So when Mr. Hughley put it out there that Mr. Smyre told him to do what? Then Ms. Woodson fought harder for the Liberty District than anybody. She's Puerto Rican, and I told her yesterday how much I appreciate what she did. Because Mr. Huff has got to pony up because he says he has some kind of plan. Well, Mr. Huff was supposed to get into the Liberty Theater and do that. I've sent you, uh, 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 I hope that Mr. Scott will be given the document. Ms. Elamine, Ms. Elamine, I'm sorry. Your five minutes have passed. Yeah, you can put her back, put her sound back on, Jeremy. Ms. Elamine, yes, ma'am. I started it right after you gave your name and your address. You get five minutes to appear before council. Now, if you want to, uh, we, we normally during meetings will allow people to come back at the end of the meeting for three additional minutes. So if you want, you can, I think you can use that same login and go back through the same route. You'll be placed in the lobby again. And at the end of the meeting, you can finish up with three additional minutes. But I'm afraid I've got to cut you off now. You, you know, I've, I've, I, I, he's got you muted and I cannot hear you. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't hear you, Ms. Elamine. If you want to sign back in at the end of, because you've used your five minutes, I was very careful about timing it after you did your announcement. Uh, you and we'll get you back in. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Uh, the next individual to appear is uh, Miss Susan Gallagher. Uh, Miss Miss Gallagher, are you are you on? Jeremy, is Ms. Gallagher on yet? Yes, she is. You're, you're muted, Susan. There we go. Oh. All right, Ms. Gallagher. You might want to unmute your board there. Am I unmuted? You yeah. are now. You are now. Okay, great. And, and I'll tell uh, you, if, uh, Ms. Gallagher, wait, just a minute. One, one minute. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Would it be possible to bring Ms. Winston on at the same time? My CEO is here also. That's fine. And and what I'll, what I'll tell you is the same thing I, I tell the other folks. You've got five minutes, and I'm going to start a timer after you introduce yourselves and give your address. And then when that five minutes is up, I'll, I'll let you know. If you want me to give you a one-minute warning, I'll be glad to. Uh, otherwise, at five minutes, I'll just have to cut you off. Okay. All right. So you can bring okay. her on, both of you give your names and your address, and then I'll start the five minute timer. Okay. Good morning, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Andre Bill Winston, CEO of New Horizons Behavioral Health, 2100 Comer Avenue, Columbus, Georgia, 31906. Good morning. Good morning. Susan. And Susan Gallagher, New Horizons Behavioral Health, 2100 Comer Avenue, 31906. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members, for having us. Susan and I just want to take a, just a few minutes to share an opportunity that, uh, not to share an opportunity, but just to share with you some things that we're seeing in the community. We wanted to bring to your attention that we're seeing or what we're labeling as the next public health crisis in our area. And we're seeing a notable increase in people that are suffering from behavioral health issues. And Susan is our Director of Marketing and Development, and she's going to share with you some of the details of what we're seeing. Susan? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Good morning, Mr. Mayor and City Council, and thank you so much for the strong leadership the 
city has had since the beginning of this COVID epidemic. I think that uh, our flattening of the curve is a testament to the uh, leadership that we've had. And then to hear Ms. Godwin speak about all the openings that the city has planned and the way you're doing it, uh, just a, a really great testament to the leadership we have here in Columbus. Um, I wanted to talk to you this morning about the COVID pandemic, the emotional, financial, and socially devastating consequences to the country and our community and the looming public mental health crisis. Although the COVID pandemic uh, touches some lives in our community, we've lost some individuals, which is tragic. We have some individuals that have uh, tested positive, close to 400 individuals, but almost everyone in the community, uh, close to 200,000 people in Muskogee County are feeling the anxiety and stress of, um, of the COVID virus. Um, in Muskogee County, at the beginning of the year, we had approximately 39,000 people living with mental illness. This equates to one in five or 20% of the population, while currently only 0.18% are testing positive for COVID. So already you can see that mental health is a, an issue that we need to address. Although the exact number of people is unknown, there are many more suffering from anxiety and depression as a result of the fear, social distancing, isolation, and widespread uncertainty due to the COVID epidemic. I uh, wanted to share with you that uh, anxiety is already the uh, leading cause of, um, of mental health uh, diagnosis in the United States with about 40 million people prior to COVID pandemic suffering from anxiety. Depression, approximately 9% of the adult population suffered from depression prior to the COVID pandemic. In Georgia, suicide is the number two leading cause of death for children ages 2 to 17 in Georgia prior to the pandemic. And it's in the top 10 leading causes of death for adults prior to the COVID uh, pandemic. I believe we're going to see increases in anxiety, depression, and suicide due to the isolation, depression, fear, anxiety of uh, living with the COVID pandemic. Now, anxiety is a normal response to a stressful situation, and depression, sadness, is a normal response. But we have to know the signs and symptoms of when we should seek help. If you're um, not sleeping well uh, for more than two weeks, if you are uh, having a your diet changes, uh, you can't eat, you're eating too much, uh, you uh, become irritable, uh, uh, irritable, anxious, um, you can't feel pleasure anymore, a uh, loss of interest, feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. These are all signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety, and we need to know when to reach out to somebody for help. Uh, it's always a good idea to reach out to your um, primary care physician First, if you don't have a primary care physician, New Horizons is here uh, to help out. We're also seeing people self-medicate with alcohol and drugs, not just the illegal drugs, but maybe overusing prescription drugs to help take the edge off of anxiety and depression. And we have to know that these are unhealthy coping mechanisms and how can we um, cope with anxiety and depression in a positive way. We see droves of people being tested on the news for COVID with widespread community outreach events, public service announcements. But the real public health emergency, the mental health, the anxiety, the depression, the tendency to use uh, substances remain hidden. At New Horizons Behavioral Health, we have experienced this dramatic request for our services due to people experiencing anxiety and depression because of the virus. Uh, New Horizons serves as your public safety net for uh, core behavioral health services to children, teens, adults, and families, and want to encourage people to visit our website, www.nhbh.org. We have a list of free online resources, apps to help manage uh, stress and anxiety. We have information on how to access the crisis line and the DBHDD emotional support line. And uh, we're always here to, to help in any any emergency. Ms. Gallagher, y'all did an amazing job. And, I, and I'm going to ask you both something. I, this is way too important an issue to try to cram into five minutes. 
So yes, why don't why don't you and I get together offline and uh, we'll set up a time for an update on the mayor's agenda and give you about ten or fifteen minutes to walk through this because oh. this is I think this is a pretty significant uh, ancillary issue that goes hand in hand with the uh, self isolation with the the you know uncertainty of what's happening from an economic and a medical standpoint. So so thank you for what you do. I know Councilor Barnes, Mr. Right. Mayor. Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you because, uh, um, you know, all of us, all of us citizens are experiencing to a certain degree of anxiety, subliminal stress and anxiety. And uh, um, Ms. Winston reached out to me uh, because we both had a concern. And so I want to thank you for allowing them to, to come on because the, the worst thing that uh, can happen, you have a lot of peer, peer people who are experiencing these symptoms and don't know how to interpret it until it gets to a point where it's very morbid. And so having them come on and explain the symptoms is, is really a godsend. And having this medium, Mr. Mayor, and the fact that you reached out to me um, to have them come is just awesome. And so I do appreciate the follow-up because this is really too important an issue to just give it a cursory look at. And so I appreciate you inviting um, Ms. Winston and uh, Ms. Gallagher so that they can go more in depth and maybe do something on CCG TV to alert. The biggest feeling thing is what Susan mentioned. A lot of people are experiencing what's called anomie. They are feeling with no feelings, and that's, that's something that they can't interpret, and they need the professional advice to help them through. So, again, right. thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm not going to delay the time. I appreciate And Andrea and Susan, thank you so much for what you're doing in the community. Oh, thank Wilson. you, Mayor. Thank you Wilson so much. Thank you, Alex. Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We'll be uh, Susan. I'll get in touch with you, and then we can yes, get you sir. back on for a little bit, little bit broader, broader discussion of the topic. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. All right. Uh, we had one other, Mr. Robert Westfall, but I think he has canceled his appearance. Is that not correct, Madam Clerk? That is correct, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Well, we'll move on to the city manager's agenda, Mr. City Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, I've got a few items uh, remaining on my agenda. I appreciate you move, allowing me to move up the confirmation of Mr. Robert Rob Scott. But the second item on my agenda is amendment to the citizen participation plan of the fiscal year 2017 through fiscal year 2021 five-year consolidation plan. Uh, the CARES Act uh, is alive, and... Um, uh, it has made available to us $981,189 in supplemental community development block grant funding for grants to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. Um, HUD has provided for the immediate availability of a five-day public comment period for amendments uh, and new plan submissions associated with uh, our plan, our five-year plan to fully utilize this regulatory waiver, uh, an amendment of the current citizen participation plan is needed. And so that's why we're coming before you today asking you to uh, approve um, for filing of amendments to our plan. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought you were finished. That's fine. Thank you, Councilor Huff. All right. Motion by Councillor Woodson, second by Councillor Huff. Any questions or discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any, any Councillor opposed? It passes. And Mayor, that's again, that's the CARES Act. That's $981,189 that we did not expect, but for the coronavirus, we would not have received it. Uh, the next item on my agenda, number three, a variance for Hampton Inn Hotel Canopy Encroachment. Um, approval is requested for the construction of a canopy over the right-of-way at 1201 Broadway that will encroach approximately 14 feet 10 inches onto the city's right-of-way along 12th Street for a distance of 30 feet 6 inches. Uh, engineering uh, received a request from family holdings um, uh, the owner of the project to construct a canopy for a drop entrance to the hotel. 
uh, and the city has authorized this type of permanent encroachment uh, in the past uh, due to um, the wide width of the right of way in the uptown area. Uh, the owner understands that should the encroachment ever become in conflict with any public improvements, the encroachment shall be removed at no cost to the city. The construction of the hotel improvements and future parking deck will eliminate approximately 12 existing parking spaces. Uh, other than that, there are no uh, financial obligations for the city. And we're bringing this before you today for your consideration. Move approval. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Um, I wanted to request a delay on this. Um, as the city uh, council member representative, it was brought to my attention that the uptown did not even was familiar with it. There's um, concerns in reference to using 12 parking spaces, while some may feel that that's not um, a lot of spaces, others do. Um, I have um, a little uh, another request from the developer. If I can please get an overlay of the um, of the drawing because the sketches that was received, the site plan that was received, had too much information on it to get a good good visual of which um, parking spaces will be removed and where. Um, I have no problem. Let me make that absolutely clear. Um, I have no objections with the uh, owning. I think it's great. I think it'll, it'll enhance. And I don't have any problems with that. My concern is with the 12 parking spots. Um, I know we have parking decks downtown, and I know we have other things. But the perception is a reality for my constituents in District 7 and throughout the city in reference to parking downtown so um, I'm only asking for my colleagues to please allow me um, two weeks which is the next council meeting so I can meet with the developer I can meet with uptown um, CSU and whoever it's going to impact so they can get a better understanding of it again I'm not saying anything against the um, Petition. I think it's beautiful. I've been to many hotels. I've been throughout the world. I know what they're talking about and asking. But I ask respectfully for this delay until all parties can get a better understanding and I can get the overlay to be able to understand about the parking spaces. Uh, and, and, and Mr. Mayor, I know that uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but I do want you and the members of council to know that the owner and owner representative are available uh, available uh, on this uh, Microsoft Teams uh, with us if there are questions that need to go directly to the owner or the owner's representative. And, and you know, with me doing delay, I'm not saying any council member who has concern or questions, they can, can you know, they can ask. And to the petitioner, um, to Tracy, um, it's nothing against the project. I just need a little bit more detail um, because I will be the one answering to the people in District 7. Uh, Uptown has requested that we please go to the table. And like any other council member has offered, just like any other council member has wanted to go back to talk to their community, I'm asking the same respect. From the developer, I'm asking a little bit more information, like an overlay on the site plan that we have, and able to get a better understanding. Um, I don't want you to think I haven't been doing my homework because even though I'm quarantined in my home for some health issues, I've had people take pictures for me and send it to me. So I'm not close-minded at all on what's going on. Um, I just think that we need to give that respect to our community. And I want to know more about them 12 spots, um, spaces that we're going to um, be losing. I also want to, um, I know it's going to sound crazy, but I also wanted to see if we were to put meters, uh, how much funding we would have received 
for for those meters being in place in those 12 spaces because right now I know the 12 spaces aren't being used and people have concern about that but we're talking 12 spaces um, I'm, I feel very confident that we can work something out where um, both my feelings and my district's feelings and the developer can achieve what it wants we're just asking for that time all right, well, there was a motion made for approval. Uh, I haven't heard a second. Second. There's a, so there's a motion and a second. Now, the motion to second, Councilor Davis, was to approve the request of, of um, to, to, to allow the variance. Councilor uh, Thomas, was that not your motion? Yes. Okay, so there's a motion to approve that variance. Now, Councilor Davis, well, is Mayor, you... Mayor, let me, uh, I mean, I just, you asked for a second on Councilor Woodson's request, and we've always honored a council member's yes, request. Yes, no, I, 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 I do I, have some comments. I, was, I know I get that. I was trying to follow protocol, and since we already had a motion on the table, I just wanted to make sure there wasn't a second on that motion before we moved to Councilor Woodson's uh, request in motion. Glenn, what he's talking about right now, um, if you second it, you will um, agree with the development, and I will not get my two weeks to talk to my constituents. Well, I will talk. Uh, I, I, I would like to speak to the first motion, and my intention is to... Uh, to delay. Well, my intention is to make a second on the motion for Council Woodson. Okay. All right. Well, but I would like to speak to the intent of the first motion. Okay. Well, there's no, there's no well, second. The first, the, uh, excuse me, Mr. Mayor. If okay. there's not been a second to my motion, it dies for the lack of a second. But we can certainly go ahead and talk about some of the items um, on this. And I do have some information that I would like to share with council um, that I've done some. Um, investigating if you will all uh, right and that's where I, we're trying to head with this it's a little difficult i know with uh, uh virtual but i was just trying to make sure we didn't have a second for your motion and i, I have heard none so that one does die there's a motion on the table today. now we can now discuss the different aspects of that so councillor thomas did you want to go ahead and proceed well, one of the um, issues that um, has come up is the, the parking on 12th Street and Front Avenue. And one of the things that, um, that I did, I spoke with um, some of the uh, instructors at CSU, which, as you know, the CSU um, education and nursing uh, facility is right across the street from this hotel. And I talked to them about parking and what um, what impact this would have on their students. Uh, I was told that, first of all, most of their students do not park there because the parking is either two-hour or four-hour parking. And if they happen to go beyond the two-hour or the four-hour parking, um, it's a $40 parking ticket. That's quite um, uh, uh, whack. <laughs> for parking and that most of the students either park um, park down in the garage across from the W.C. Bradley Company. The W.C. Br uh, Br that, that parking garage has spaces that are reserved for CSU students. Um, in talking with the um, owner and the developer of this property, I was told that they would uh, agree in their parking garage, the 90 space parking garage that they're going to build there, to have some parking available for uh, CSU students in the same manner that the parking garage across from the W.C. Bradley Company has. Um, I think we can work out that parking. Uh, it is not Broadway parking. It is 12th Street and Front Avenue parking. Um, and this, um, I think this facility, in order for them to do what they need to do to make it um, a viable 
facility, they're going to need that kind of, of um, entrance and that kind of canopy and so forth. And so uh, I, I'm willing to give um, Councilor Woodson's uh, delay. Sure, if we need to do that, that's fine. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize that as far as the CSU students are concerned, I think we can take care of that. And I think the owner is willing to do something to help take care of that. The parking um, deck that they are talking about will be open to the public. Uh, and so uh, other uh, um, others than the CSU parking, the CSU students can park in that deck. Um, there's uh, some other parking around that um, might be uh, as convenient um, as as that parking deck so um if we need to delay uh so councillor woodson can talk with her constituents i don't have a problem with that um, i just would like to i don't want to delay it too much longer though because i know that the uh, construction needs to go forward thank you mr mayor okay. right. and, 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 um, oh. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to uh, go back to Councillor Thomas's uh, uh, motion, and and let me uh, let me say why. First of all, uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of admit trying to figure out. I've got different civil plans here. I've got one that was approved April third, and then I've got a revision that was done on March twenty fifth with new intentions, and usually. My concern with this kind of stuff is usually all these things take place early on. I mean, construction's already started, and all these plans and revisions should have been done a long time ago, and now we're doing them, um, you know, just recently they were approved. Now, I, I don't know what's going on there, but that's one concern of mine. The, the canopy request, I look at, you, you've got, really, you've got two separate requests here. Okay, and I don't know how they're being commingled and why they're being commingled. Uh, I, I don't have a problem. I think the canopy needs to go ahead and the canopy, the request for the resolution we have, is an encroachment on the right of way to build a cantilever canopy. That's it. That's what the resolution says. Now, somewhere in the staff report, it says the elimination of. 12 parking spaces. I don't think the parking spaces, the elimination of the 12 parking spaces has anything to do with the request to do a cantilever canopy. They need to go ahead. We need to approve that today. To be honest with you, it's a separate it's a separate request, but they need that from a standpoint to keep moving forward on their construction. You know, because that is part of the building, and I'm not sure New Darren or, or somebody can maybe answer that there may be some construction aspect that needs to start happening now to make that happen i don't know but that wouldn't slow things down the parking the elimination of parking is a whole separate issue and that's not something that really needs to be done today i mean you're not opening the hotel anytime soon it's a matter of erasing lines and you know and really what it looks like is they would like to have their private entryway and a drop off uh, uh, pickup drop off ballet that they can move into their garage. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with a curb cut. It is several curb cuts. But, you know, my overall issue is in a lot of these things we've been doing lately, um, you know, there's a lot of money that's going into these streetscapes. There's a lot of money that the taxpayers have funded for a lot of stuff. And I just get the feeling like in, you know, in the last several years, we've been giving away a lot and we don't really get a return on our investment. So, I mean, I'm questioning the value of the elimination of the spaces. It's not a question of the use. Uh, I think it's a valid use, but still the elimination of those uh, spots and then going through a public process. So everybody's on the same page. Um, I, you know, I think there's a way to make that happen. Uh, I would like to have that opportunity to talk with the developer and see if they would be interested. But I would like to propose maybe a compensation out of the tax 
revenue that would come in off of this project that would go into a tag fund that we would take the, those funds in compensation or in lieu of these parking spaces and maybe let's say put them in a an art fund or some kind of improvement in the uptown area which is which is uh, 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 legal you can do that and uh, in that way there's there's some consistency in what we've done in the past I know with the WC Bradley company when they came and asked for us or something at 11th and Bay they wanted some right away to build their patio and all that wasn't an issue but they compensated the city for it uh, I think it's just creating a a level playing field for everybody and the presidents across the board where you know everybody's treating the same and that there's some some kind of value that's being uh, considered in between the the uh, mayor the the last thing I wanted to throw well I'll tell you what I'm gonna hold because I still think there's two separate requests here and I mean I I seconded Councilor Woodson's delay request because I felt like the parking could wait and and it can be discussed. Now I don't know where that's going. I'd love to hear from other colleagues, but I do think that the canopy, uh, uh, the cantilever canopy request, as is, is a separate issue from what we're talking about with the elimination of parking spaces. So. Uh, maybe there's a possibility of moving forward on that one item today, but holding back on the elimination of the parking spaces. And I'll just yield to my fellow council members on that. But I, I would like to circle back as a observation on what we're doing here and how it relates not only to this whole hotel, but some other hotels. I think the city needs to try to work on that. We've talked about this before, and I think it's a good time to have that discussion. Well, Mr. City Attorney, um, what are they specifically asking for? I, mean, we, I thought they were asking for the, uh, oh. the encroachment going out into the, the parking area as well. Uh, the resolution, the way it reads, Mayor, is the uh, use of the right-of-way for a certain number of feet. Uh, and it doesn't specify a height for the canopy and so it could include other things besides a canopy the way it's written now and that was my reason for the delay mayor if i may because i did look at the canopy being made probably we can go ahead and prove that and then the spaces but it's not very clear that's why i was asking for the overlaid and that's why i was asking to meet because there were some questions there um i don't have a problem with the canopy i'm just having problem on how it all works but this request here is not very clear um, and again council member um, Thomas thank you um, I appreciate it and so do my constituents the opportunity to discuss this a little further I will promise you it will not be more than two weeks it'll be by our next and I would say let's let's um, if we're gonna delay it let's delay the whole thing because if we if we approve the canopy today and then come back in two weeks and say, no, you can't have the parking places, that impacts what the construction uh, and what the company's gonna do. So if we're gonna delay it, delay the whole thing, come back in two weeks and move perhaps a clearer um, explanation of exactly what, what the owner wants to do. Well, let me, let me just say, I'm, I'm looking I'm looking at the civil plan. It, the, the canopy does not go out over into the parking spaces. It's on the right of way of the sidewalk. That's what we're talking about. But so, Jim, what I'm saying is if we don't give them the parking places, that may impact their use of the, um, their desire for the canopy. Let's just delay the whole thing and get it clear and make sure that everybody understands what we're approving and what we're not approving or whatever. And it won't make a difference, I, you know. Well, the motion was, uh, the motion Mayor. was, to, delay, uh, the motion was Mayor. to delay the whole request. And well, why don't you ask Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. Um, I've got our city engineer 
ready to, to clear up some of this. And I think we need to hear from uh, Newt Aaron and the owner uh, so that some of we that they would clear up some of the questions and observations that are being made that and we got the people here that can answer those questions so i would uh, respectfully request that uh, my city engineer get to respond and uh and then newt aaron and tracy sayers and maybe we can clear up some of this and if there's a delay which it appears there's going to be a delay then you can still delay it but let's hear from them Okay. I agree. That would at least um, answer any questions that the counselors have at this present moment. It doesn't interfere with us having a delay. So if that's okay, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to ask um, City Engineer Donna Newman to weigh in first, and I'm going to ask that um, uh, we uh, uh, remove, allow them to come into the meeting from the lobby, uh, Tracy Sears and Newt Aaron, uh, as at simultaneously with uh, Engineer Donna Newman speaking. So, uh, Engineer Newman, if you will, and Jeremy, if you will allow Newt Aaron and Tracy Sayers into the meeting. Donna Newman. Good morning. Uh, yes, when I reviewed the request, the canopy is directly tied to the drop-off area, which is where you get the removal of the parking spaces. And that's the reason uh, the notation was made in the agenda report. Now, the um, resolution is tied to the canopy, and it does give the dimensions that was provided by the developer for the canopy, um, including the height. It does not mention the parking um, because in the uptown area, they're really the normal parking regulations have been waived. Donna, this is Charmaine. What do you mean in the uptown area, the parking regulations have been waived? There's a zoning classification for uptown, um, and because of the uh, shared parking amongst all the businesses, the normal requirements for parking for um, those type uses have strict guidelines and standards for the number of spaces uh, for the use of the, the business and the size of the business. So, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to ask Newt Aaron and um, Tracy Sayers to um, sign on and uh, weigh in at this time. All right, Mr. Aaron. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. City Manager, and all of your counselors. This is Newt Aaron. We're the project managers for the development. Uh, what we can offer is that since... Uh, City Engineer Donna Newman expressed some concern about possible concern about the loss of spaces. We have worked on this plan to reduce the loss. Uh, and uh, I have two things to offer for your consideration. One is uh, Councillor Thomas is exactly correct that the loss of the spaces has to do with the drop off and the canopy. So they are related very clearly. That's really a kind of a preface. Uh, first thing I'd offer is that. We have are planning to build a approximately 90 space parking deck, and we're not required to provide any on-site parking, uh, as uh, City Engineer Donna uh, has said. So we're in effect adding to the available spaces for guests of the hotel as well as the public these spaces. We're really not taking spaces away for, uh, from other businesses. We're adding to them because the ones on the street won't be used for the hotel. Uh, they'll be available for CSU or from other businesses in the area. Uh, and it's a pretty significant add, uh, to tell you the truth. The, the former businesses on the site use street parking, uh, the Aaron Rents and the uh, Phoenix Finance that was next door, both of which now are, are gone. Uh, so I'd like to offer that to you for your consideration. The other is we've had one uh, idea come up 
related to the number of uh, ADA or handicap parking spaces. Uh, on the CSU side of the street, there are three ADA spaces. And on the Hampton side, as we have shown it, there are three more. In addition, there are two, one on the uh, north and one on the south of Broadway handicap spaces. And there are four to be provided in the parking deck. This is a number of handicapped spaces that is greatly in excess of what would be required in a normal parking lot. Uh, if we could reduce the number of handicapped spaces on the Hampton side of 12th Street from three to one, we would be able to convert each one of those handicapped spaces into two regular parking spaces. So the loss would be reduced by two. Uh, of on-street parking. So those are the two things. I, I would w also like to offer just for your consideration the reason that the street work was took longer to develop than the rest of the plans is figuring out the utilities in an old section of, of uptown and getting the right water lines and the right uh, power service was very difficult. We had to work very closely with all the utility providers, and it just took some time to work out what, what we needed to do. Uh, and that kept all this from being uh, brought to the fore in, as fast as it would. So I hope that has been helpful to you a little bit. Um, I have a question, um, Mr. Aaron, if it's possible. Um, those 12, those spaces you're offering in the parking lot, aren't those, aren't your um, guests going to be playing for parking? How would you be able to distinguish um, which ones are, are for the public and how would you be able to ensure those parking spaces? Well, of course, we can mark the spaces uh, if that is appropriate, uh, Councilor Woodson. Uh, the, the parking into the deck and out of the deck will be managed by a parking control system. Uh, the guest will be using their uh, room key, uh, in effect, to be able to enter and exit. The public would be able to enter, and then they would, would pay uh, for a fee, which is, I understand, the w same way it works across the street. Uh, so that's how that would work. OK. Well, I hope you. Um I hope you agree in my delay so we can have some conversations and I can get a, a little more, more um, an overlay and a little bit more understanding of the parking spaces. Um, I am not against your project at all. Um, I think the canopy will be beautiful. I understand being able to go in and protect it from the rain and the wind and for a drop off. I just um, have concerns and my constituents do in reference to the 12 parking spaces and what will be available to them and how would the controlling will be of the uh, public spaces because if um, I'm a guest or, or I'm going to be a guest and I'm getting ready to check in and I see there's some spaces available. I won't pay the hotel. I'll use those um, because it's free. So it's just some questions I have. Additionally, I just didn't want to take up all the time today in discussing this. I'd rather for us to meet uh, via conference this way, all of us to meet and have that discussion so that I can have a clear understanding and feel more comfortable. But again, I'm not against it. I just need better understanding in reference to the parking because I understand we say there's plenty of parking. I understand that, but a perception is a reality and my uptown residents and my uptown businesses, it's a reality to them. And um, the response I've had from a couple people is that they didn't know anything. So I think it's only appropriate and respectful if we go back to the table and say, you know, I apologize you weren't aware. Here's what we propose. Here's how you get a better understanding. And then we can all see, see how it could be beneficial to all. Councilor Woodson, I would be glad to uh, assist you in providing additional information. Thank you. I truly appreciate you. Mr. Aaron, I got a question for you. How many, uh, how many uh, rooms are going to be in the hotel? 89, I believe. Uh, 89, 90 parking spaces? 
Yes. So that's pretty much my code for the uh, building structure, right? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Councilor. That's that pretty much my code it. for the building structure, right? By code, I'm, I'm not sure what your question is, actually. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, space per room. The building code uh, for this site does not require any on site parking. As uh, the city. For, a, for an 89 room hotel? They could park anywhere in uptown then. The building code does not require any. That's 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 the way the law is. Okay. What about the Hilton standards? Are they going to require you to have parking spaces for the rooms? Of, of course. Okay. Um, well, I don't have, are you have a drop off point. Are you going to have a drop off point within the garage to to uh, enter the hotel? Not as such. We will have a place where the people leaving their cars can walk around to the front entrance. You'll have an entryway through the garage into the hotel, into the check-in area? It will be outside the hotel. So you come in the front? You come in the front, that's your only entryway? That's correct. Well, there's a corridor on the second floor. There is no public access from the ground level, uh, Councilor Davis. Uh, but on the second level, there will be a door that will be allowed uh, access if you have a room key. Uh, it if goes, you, to, it goes to the lobby, right? That that would go to the lobby. Okay. However, if when you're checking in, you would not have a room key yet. So you would. I would understand. Provided. So, I understand, and and that's okay. You got to have a curb cut to get into the uh, garage. But you said there's going to be a a uh, a security pad at the gate, so you got either got to have a key or a code or some access to get in the garage, right? It's going to be controlled. Not, not to get in, but to get out. Not to get in the garage. Not to get in. You cannot have public access if you you have to have a key to get in or, sell or pay to get in. That's not been designed fully, but the idea is you can get in, but you'd either have to have a room key or pay to get out. Right, okay, okay. And that's subject to whoever you choose to, to use and pay for the parking, correct? Property. I, I don't think, you know, really the CSU thing that came up, I really don't think that's a, a problem. They have their own parking um, and Mayor, if I may, I, I, uh, Mr. Aaron, one more question. Do, do you have any issues with your uh, cantilever canopy being approved today so you can move forward? Is there any aspect of construction that would be delayed because of this? The delay will not delay things, uh, to, to answer that part of the question. Uh, I would prefer that we try to work through all of it together because the canopy might be impacted, the design might be impacted uh, by whether or not there's a drop off. Uh, uh, well, you plan to build the canopy regardless, right? I mean, that's the way the plans read. Perhaps not to the same extent. But you got, yeah, okay, all right. Um, I'm just looking at the plans. I don't know if this is the correct approved plans from. Uh, uh, I guess it's the streetscape plans where it shows it in yellow from French and Associates already marked. Well, I'm not sure what you're looking at, but what I would I'm say looking is looking at the uh, approved plans from three tw revised plans of three twenty twenty three twenty one uh, from French and Associates on your streetscape plans and encroachment. Uh, yes, I, I believe that I'm looking <laughs> at the same plan. Okay. All right. Okay, well, if it's not, I, I was just trying to help you move your project along. Um, Mayor, if I may, one of the things, when we talked uh, a while back, when we were talking about the meters in Uptown, one of the things I mentioned was you may want to look close at how the utilization of parking spaces throughout Uptown is going to work with all our new hotels, and certainly we're glad they're all coming in, and, you know, and and... They're all going to be different, but I mean, everybody 
uh, everybody will function different. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, these, a lot of it is business matters, business related. That's okay. That can all be worked out. I, I do think that the city, though, the city's got to really look at this. And I'll tell you why, because people sometimes, uh, I'm going to use myself as an example, all right? Because a lot of times I'll go to town and, uh, you know, I, I don't, necessarily agree with the parking agreements of hotels so i'm going to look for alternative parking all right and i think that you got a lot of people that kind of think that way let's just say you got people that are cheap and they don't they don't want to pay it okay <laughs> and uh they're going to look for alternative ways to to uh to move around I think what you're going to find out is that there's a lot of parking places down there that people are going to park and just pull their totes over to these hotels uh, to avoid paying for parking, which is going to create a, a problem. you got a number of rooms. you got a night at any given time, the number of people coming into Columbus. I think that's going to have to be addressed somehow because the small, what I'm hearing, and I think is part of this discussion is the small business owners are concerned about losing spaces or hotel patrons deciding to park in their spaces and then nobody has adequate parking. Now, there are some places where it has two-hour parking, so maybe it's an enforcement issue. Maybe there's some meter aspect to it, but you've got some parking, for example, across the street with Sonovas, there's no time limits. So... I mean, people may start parking in places other than in a parking garage or a directed parking garage <clears throat> that may cause some problems. I think that's something that the city needs to get ahead of. Uh, I think the owners would probably agree. I mean, whatever you want can do, you want to direct them to park in those garages. So trying to find some kind of enforcement or mechanism to get those people to park in these garages versus parking out on the street, I think it's going to be a, uh, and then you can add in the CSU school and everybody else. It's could, could create a problem. I think we need to get ahead of. And I agree. I think that's why we had that, that meeting. We'll have, we'll probably have some subsequent meetings. And I think when you start seeing one of these hotels impact parking and I don't, I don't, I don't know that it will. I mean, if they're if it's on their bill and they they got ninety spaces right there, I, you know. But we will. You're right. We'll know. I think as that sort of evolves, um, where some of the gaps are, uh, and and it's a it's a moving it's a moving target at this point uh, in the uptown area. And uh, so I, you know, I think you make a, make a good point. Well, and Mr. Mayor, let me just say that uh, Deputy City Manager Goodwin has a team, and she has presented to council. <coughs> Uh, she's working with the CPD, with Columbus State University, with Uptown Columbus, Mr. Lontford, uh, and um, some of the uh, stakeholders. Uh, they've had, they started the public hearing process, and what I saw was that people came out overwhelmingly in the initial meeting supporting parking meters. We didn't get to have the second meeting because of coronavirus and all of that, but those things that Councilor Davis mentioned are being um, discussed and considered as they proceed forward with the study that will eventually come back to city council with a recommendation. And Mr. Man, let me let me just highlight this matter. You got two hotels that are right on top of each other. Both of them have parking garages, and I'm gonna say what access. Let's just say 160, 170 rooms. If at any given time those are full, even if you took 10% or 15% of those spaces that people choose to park out on the street, um, you can see it's, that's going to be a problem. Well, so, and that, I don't know the easy answer, but I would like, I guess, my whole point of this conversation is for the city to try to get ahead and work with these business owners to try to find a way to encourage the parking deck parking and a way to encourage the ones who are going to try to scapegoat it and take the easy route and get them where they need to be so everybody has adequate parking. That's, that's my only concern. Yeah, and, and I understand. And as we go through this parking study with parking or questioning, it's, in, we have it's, parking in general, it's not 
singling anybody out or any hotel business. It, it's going to be a general issue with all of them. Well, and I get that. And so we are looking at a, 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 taking a holistic view of this. Our uptown is evolving even more than, I mean, we thought we had an awesome uptown. <clears throat> we, we ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> I use the word ain't because it's about to happen. And we have got to do, do a comprehensive look at parking and, and these hotels are coming online and adding parking. And, and he's talking about 90 spaces. When I travel, whether it's Savannah, Augusta, or, I go with the assumption that when I pull in the garage, I got to pay, <laughs> you know. And and I use, if I'm traveling on business, I use the cities, and I pay for parking. And so when people come to Columbus, they're out, they're just amazed that they pull in and we don't have to pay. You know, pay to park at a hotel. That just blows their minds, you know. And so I, I think we're going somewhere with what, you know, uh, we, we got TADS being developed, $169 million, W.C. Bradley, Rinkish got his thing going, um, uh, Family Holdings got their thing going, um, and, and and other developments. We we got to have a, a parking plan that works, and I'm glad to hear him say that they're building 90 spaces uh, that will be available, and, and it'll be added to our inventory, and... And when people come to town, they're going to expect to pay to park in that parking garage. So it's exciting to me, and I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm excited about the canopy. I don't know how you get excited about a can, canopy. I'm excited about the canopy, you know. And, and that blows my mind that I'm excited about a canopy. <laughs> so, but thank you, and, and, and we're looking at the parking mission. I have some questions. Because... In when Mr. Aaron was speaking, he said approximately 90 spaces. He wasn't specific. And then he said that there's 89 rooms and 90 spaces. So that is one parking spot per room. And I don't see where there's extra parking space there. Uh, if the, if the hotel is full, then all the parking spaces are going to be used. There's not going to be additional room for public parking. And then they're going to be controlling the parking in an area, in a block of uptown Columbus that is growing right now. That There's a lot of new businesses going into that block. There's a lot of, you know, there's a limited amount of parking already because we don't have the parking lot like we do in the 100 block that people could use. I, I'm afraid, I'm concerned, I'm not afraid, I'm concerned that it could hurt some of these new businesses that are, that are getting started in that block because, they're, because of the lack of parking. Well, you know, I, what I would counter with though is if you've got if you've got that hotel full, there's 89 rooms full. That's going to uh, that's going to really boost the opportunity for every business around there. I think that's why so many new businesses are going because they see that hotel, they hope it is full. And if there is a parking challenge, you know, we're going to have to find a way to mitigate it. What, but well, well, I, I think they're going to get in front of it this time. I just. Well, another side of that, Mayor, if we've got 90 parking spaces and 89 rooms, there's a percentage of people. I hope everybody's not driving to Columbus, Georgia. I hope they're flying in, you know. And so everybody at the hotel didn't drive. And, and, and if they did drive, hopefully there were more than one person in a car, you know. So, I, but, but I'm going to sit in. one car per room. I mean, yeah. yes, there might be two people in a yeah. car, well, but and, those two people will be in yeah. the same room together. Well, and, and after, you know, um, I, I agree with the mayor. It's a good problem if that happens because I mean, I've gone to hotels where I drove and I got there and they had signs out saying garage full. They had a good problem. and they But they directed you that there's a parking garage one block over or two blocks over, 
and they'll get you to the hotel. I, I, I've experienced that many times where the garage at the hotel I'm staying at is full. So I, I don't know how that works in that industry, but I've, I've encountered that. I'm not sure how this works. Is there, are you, am I on mute, Jeremy? No, you're in. You're in. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Isaiah, you're right. Uh, in Columbus, about 71% of the people drive. About 29% get here by airplane or some other method. So uh, you're, uh, Charmaine, that may, gives you sort of a, a yield of, you know, 20 to 30 rooms available a day. And the other thing I wanted to make you aware of is that we provide, for the last 10 years, we've provided 24 spaces at our 1222 Broadway building, free to the public in the evenings and every weekend at no charge. That's also a buffer for us if we need it. But we'll also continue to make those available to the public like we always have. And I understand we're a small business just like the people down in our block that, you know, they've been their customers have been able to use that space when they needed to go to their stores on the weekend and evenings. And so... We're, we're attuned to it. We're more than willing to, uh, uh, Mimi, meet with you. We just submitted our, our request in the normal process, and we didn't really know about public access. And Ernie Smallman is the one who brought to our attention if we changed the handicap access areas that, in fact, we could probably add two more spaces back on that 12th Street side. So, look, we, we want to work with you. Um, we, we don't. You know, and Glenn asked a question about Hilton's requirements for parking. There's very limited requirements in an uptown urban area from the franchisor. So we work between all those. And, you know, we want to be a good uptown citizen. We operate businesses today in the uptown, in the bid area. Um, we're, we're just as we, our people experience the same parking problems as everybody else down there. So we're pretty mindful to all that. But I do Tracy, want to tell you, it's been incredibly expensive to build a parking deck. Tracy, well, I want to say um, thank you very much for re respecting my my request. And as a business person and a person that you have other projects, you understand what I mean about being inclusive. There isn't, I haven't heard anything against the um, canopy or, or what you're doing, just concerns about a better understanding about the 12 parking spaces, a better understanding of, you know, the parking deck of people being able to park, charge, or free. And I didn't want to take a lot of time, you know, today in, in some of the questions I received because I wanted us to go to the table, discuss it, like every other council member ever done in the past and myself go back to the table discuss it with my constituents and yourself come and have find a happy medium come back to council and say hey we met we found a happy medium now we're ready to approve the project so that is the reason why i'm asking you and i appreciate for you agreeing to delay it for two weeks two weeks i don't think it's gonna hurt because you still have a lot of work to do a lot to do. Uh, Mr. City Manager, Pop Barnes here. Yes, sir. Um, Isaiah, I know that uh, Deputy City Manager Lisa Goodwin did an excellent job um, in um, investigating the parking down, and she had all the players involved and spoke to all of the businesses and whatever, to Columbus State and whatever. Uh, could we at some point revisit that? Because I don't think we really have a huge problem with parking, as we may think. I know she did an excellent job, and I know she, um, I think she was going to bring us a presentation. If she, can, if, if she can bring that back again so that we can all look at this here, I appreciate it. Yes, sir. We will be coming back. Uh, we did not close that out uh, only because of the coronavirus that we had to cancel the final public hearing or public meeting, but we will be coming back to you. And, and I appreciate that because I know that she took the time to bring all the players and and, and, um, I, and it was a, just an excellent study. So if, if she would do that, I think, uh, I don't, I'm going to be honest with you, Isaiah, I don't think we have the parking problem that a lot of people envision that we do. And I've met you at, at in Savannah when Savannah, you have to go to uh, go to the hotel. You have to find another place. 
I don't think we have that much of a problem. And I think she brought out a lot of really intrinsic things um, specific to Columbus that really helped us in that regard. So if, if she could bring that back and we can revisit it, I appreciate it. Will do. And Pops, this is Mimi. Thank you very much. I did reach out to Lisa, too, to help us get a better understanding when we have our meetings. And I did ask her some questions, and she's doing some research for me. But you're absolutely correct. I think from time and time, we do need to bring that presentation so our community is aware of the impact of parking. Because as you and I both know, sometimes uh, uh, reception becomes a reality and so have to show what that is. But thank you very much for your support. I appreciate it, Pops. All right, any further discussion? We have a- uh, Yes, yeah, Mayor. Yes? Before we leave, whether we delay this resolution or not, we need to get language in the bottom of the resolution concerning the height of this uh, canopy. This can be added right after the word length. We need something like with minimum 10 foot, five and a half inch height clearance. If we could just get everybody's approval, that that'll be added. Someone will move to add those words. I'll make that motion. And I'll second it. Motion second to amend it as stated. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Thank you. All right, now there's a motion second to delay for two, two weeks. Yes. You can go ahead, Mayor. I well, I wanted to ask the city attorney a question. I just want to make sure that, uh, again, I, I still view this as two separate requests, but are there any, are there any uh, to the requirements in this and turning this over, this encroachment over and turning the parking spaces over to a business entity? Or should there be any legal requirements or understanding or any kind of documentation on any of this that we don't have today? Or who's responsible or who does what with, with this space or is it still public space? Well, it's still going to be on the public right away. We're allowing an encroachment uh, with a canopy, with or without these parking spaces removed, that, that'll be a later decision. But the developer understands that if the city comes back and needs that uh, canopy space, I believe that's in your agenda report. That, that, I'm, that's I'm, talking removed. About I'm talking about the I'm talking about the elimination of spaces and allowing the business to use that as their own entryway. Did we need any mm -hmm. legal requirements and understandings to go along with that? Not other than this approval of council to allow the encroachment. Are you saying the elimination of spaces is an encroachment? Yes, sir. Is the engineer still on the line? She might want to comment on that. I am. Um, I was just going to note that that would be part of the permit, the removal of the parking spaces and that being the, the drop-off area. That would then be part of the permit for that location. And the separate operation of that for the business, they're just, they can do whatever they want. not necessarily do whatever they want. They can use it as a drop-off area if that is what they've requested. And that's what's that's on what the plan. The permit's tied to the plan. So that's if they the change it... Are you talking about the garage, that they can do whatever they want to do to run the garage? No, 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 no. I'm talking about the elimination at the up front to use it as an entryway, a drop-off point, ballet, etc. I'm sure that's what it's going to be used as, and I don't have a problem with that. I just, I'm asking the city attorney, do we need the city? Does the city need any legal documents to go along with that request to protect the city or to have an understanding? Right now, it's just an understanding that I see that if there's ever an issue with the canopy, the cantilever canopy, the city can make a decision on it. But I don't see anything dealing with issues out on the street, which could be 
traffic issues, et cetera. Does there need to be any kind of legal agreements for all parties? I'm not aware of another agreement that's needed in this case, Counselor. Ms. Newman, yeah. are you? No, as I said, it would become part of the permit, and the plan is part of the permit, so. Okay, I just want to get that out of the way so they can uh, move forward with uh, any kind of paperwork and have to come back later. All right. All right. We've got, we got a motion and a second to delay for two weeks. Are there any other discussion? All right. All, all in favor of the two-week delay, say aye. 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 Anybody, any counselor opposed? All right. Item number three is delayed for two weeks. Thank you very much to my colleagues and yourself, Mayor and City Manager. Appreciate it. Sure. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the next item on my agenda um, is another allocation of um, CARES Act funding. It's U.S. Department of Justice Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding Program Grant Solicitation. It's $339,756 that would go to the sheriff, police, and fire. Uh, All right, I'd, Madam Clerk, could you get who made that approval? Or that? I made the, re the uh, first approval. Well, I'll second it. All right, motion and a second to approve item four. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any counselors aye. opposed? It'll pass. So again, that's um, CARES Act funding, 339756 And so we've shared with you CDBG funding and, uh, and then uh, this uh, U.S. Department of Justice funding. And you know that we've got uh, funding through METRA and we are tracking or trying to find every dollar that should be available to us uh, as an entitlement city. Uh, from uh, those CARES Act funding, and so we will be reporting back to you as we receive them and then how we anticipate uh, dispersing those dollars. Um, and Mr. First... Manager, yes. Manager, as I understand, all of those funds are restricted for specific purposes generally. For example, the Metro fund has to be spent for Metro. It can't be spent to pay... Your salary, for example. That is correct. Yes. <laughs> yes. But I will tell you that we have been in constant contact. I've had I've had communication with the governor, with um, Congressman Bishop, Congressman Ferguson, and I've got a scheduled call with uh, Count, uh, Senator Perdue. And, and all those on two separate issues. One is uh, in the CARES Act, there existed the uh, authorization for a governor of a state to allow up to 45% to be distributed for reimbursement, actual cost reimbursement, reimbursement uh, attributable to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, and they're working, ACCG and GMA are working on a formula that they presented to the governor, the city manager, and Lisa Goodwin and uh, Robert Futrell have put together uh, some, some uh, expenditures that they have, it, it was just a survey. They're not those aren't the hard, fast numbers, but to give them an idea. Now, the, the meeting with uh, Senator Perdue is to discuss this new proposed wave of CARES funding. Uh, and there's actually been some talk about uh, trying to make sure that the budgets of local governments that are impacted uh, might be eligible for some relief in being able to continue to provide normal uh, uh, services and, and fulfill their obligations to their, their communities. Uh, so that's still in the formulation stage, but we, I, I only mention it because I want you to know, as the city manager said, every dollar that is available to help make our community whole as a result of this COVID-19, we have people turning over every rock and looking under every leaf. So we'll give you a, a more formal report once we get all this stuff tallied up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so under purchases, I've got Ridge Road Bridge at Cooper Creek. Um, it's $2.2 million, um, asking you to authorize execution of a construction contract. Second. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second to approve the Ridge Road Bridge. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Any counselors opposed? That passes. Can I and ask for uh, approval but with an explanation of each one for um, B and C? Sure. And, and let me just say that um, on the Reese Road Bridge, for those watching by television, um, it's been a long time coming. And Councilor Pop Barnes, that we've met you on site. I think we've met Charmaine Crab out there on site about this bridge. Uh, but uh, project includes complete, complete demolition of the existing bridge, construction of new bridge structure, relocation of water and sewer lines, installation of curb and gutter, asphalt pavement, sidewalk, and guardrail. And I wanted to say that because, you know, I, I've gone out personally to meet city councilors out there uh, on this, and uh, it's a long time coming. Um, Isaiah? Yes, sir. I just want to thank you. I still remember that day, and I know you were busy when you took time out of your schedule I, I, and came out there, and you were the ones. You said, we do need to do something, Councilor Barnes, and you had that same afternoon, you had those orange cones put up there and the feedback of, of, of thankfulness from that area, that community. Sharon Bunn was out there with her husband and, and, and a student. Charmaine uh, was out there. It was just such a, a feeling of relief. And trust me when I told, I told the people that I, you came out there because of the concern I had and you had those, you acted immediately. And so I just wanna publicly thank you for coming out there and just seeing for yourself the hazardous condition and acting promptly and doing something. Well, thank you, sir. And so, Mayor, there is a there is a motion for B and C. Is there a second? I second. Second. Okay. Motion second to approve B and C. Any uh, concerns or questions about either one of them? All in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody so, opposed? All right. That's so, Mr. You run through it. Yes. And, and let me just say on the Reach Road, um, Deputy City Manager Hodge is telling me on that bridge it's a nine month timeline. So it's it's gonna move pretty quick. Yeah. And then the ammunition for police department was number two. And um, and then the third one is plumbing and irrigation. Uh, supplies with West Georgia Plumbing Supply uh, in the amount of $61,919.85 on an as-needed basis. Uh, and, um, of course, plumbing supplies are used by our Public Works Department Facility Maintenance Division as needed. And so those are the, the purchases, uh, Mayor, and I am going to go into, I've got three updates remaining uh, the first one on stormwater, and then we're going to do tax allocation districts, and then we're going to do the monthly finance update. And so the stormwater update, I'm going to turn to Deputy City Manager Pam Hodge and Engineer Director uh, Donna Newman, and they have some guests with them from Barge Design Solutions, uh, David Bishop and Scott Thompson. And so Deputy City Manager Hodge or uh, Engineer Donna Newman, would you... Um, introduce um, what we're going to be talking about today. Sure. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, we have brought with us today our consultants from Barge. Uh, they work with us on all of our stormwater projects. Um, and we just wanted to provide you with an update of some of the uh, key areas that we have been looking at. Barge has done a lot of work with uh, with us on these and how we have prioritized these projects uh, for your consideration. Uh, we will be uh, coming back um, to move forward with uh, the some of these as funding is available and also to talk to you about uh, funding options uh, related to this, but wanted to make sure that you're aware of these conditions um, in some of the uh, key areas of the city. and. At this time, I'll turn it over either to Dave, David or Scott um, to make the presentation. You should be seeing uh, the presentation uh, this morning on your screen. Okay. Well, um, my name is David Bishop. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor, 
council. Uh, well, and, uh, and, and uh, David, let me just interrupt you to say okay. that you need to explain. Some counselors may not be um, virtual, but on the phone. So you really need to make sure you give a description that they can follow um, okay. on the phone. Okay. Well, today what we wanted to uh, present is uh, something that we've uh, brought to the city manager um, and to Ms. Donna Newman and Ms. Pam Hodge um, previously and just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of what we are seeing, um, which is a, uh, we've got a town that's got some aging infrastructure that not a lot of people get to see, but uh, when they do fail, uh, that's when people see it. And uh, we're having, we've been noticing that's been failing at a much higher rate than in the past. And so we just wanted to bring everybody up to speed where we are, what we've been seeing, and then uh, we can talk a little bit about the financial aspect of that as well. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Scott to kind of start off the presentation. Um, and if anybody has any questions as we go through it, you would just stop us and we can explain anything that you got any questions about. So, Scott, I'll let you kind of take it from here. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, like we said, we want to just make you aware of the stormwater projects that we've seen in the past few years. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. This map, we have a map that shows all the stormwater projects that have been identified to date. And, and the purpose of this map is to show that these projects have been identified throughout the entire city. Um, really just trying not to focus on downtown, but as the city as a whole. Um, we will get into more detail with these projects further down in the presentation. Next slide. What we did is we took each, each of these identified projects and assigned a scoring grade to them using the criteria shown related to safety, flooding, property type, utility impact, environmental impact, and traffic impact. We use this weighted score to generate a score and assign a grade A, B, C, D, and F to the project. F being the projects that need immediate attention and A not as critical. Next slide. This is the results of that grading and you can see the first six projects received a grade of F, meaning they need immediate attention. Um, and then it goes down the line, D, C, B, and A. And one thing to note is these projects are graded this way currently. Um, the longer that they are not completed, the grade will tend to, to uh, degrade into a, a lower grade with needing more immediate attention. Next slide. So we have a few examples um, working, starting with some of the F graded projects. Uh, this is the Caribbean baskets along the river walk right in the downtown area below Bay Avenue at Sonova's Bank. Uh, with every flood where the, the river floods over the river walk, these baskets are being compromised. Uh, they're just, the, the foundation is being undermined by the, the flooded water. And every, every event worsens the situation. Uh, one key thing to note here, and the reason this project is, is of high priority, is there is a very large sewer interceptor line in that slope uh, owned by Columbus Waterworks that, that uh, transfers wastewater combined sewer to the treatment plant and um, really just cannot afford to compromise that line. Next slide. I have a few more pictures of this. You can see on the photo on the left, the baskets are supposed to be about 18 inches tall, and it has sunk down to being only probably four or five inches tall. That's due to just the lack of foundation footing being washed out. The intent of this design was to have vegetation growing on the baskets, which would stabilize it, but um, the maintenance that has resulted just it hasn't worked out and is failing. 
This next project is out on Linton Road. Probably everyone has seen the wall directly adjacent to the road. It is is failing, uh, water seeping through. Uh, we currently have a design. The previous Gabion basket is under proposal. We have a proposal submitted to the city to, to redesign that project. Many of these projects um, are already designed but not yet constructed. This is an example of that. We have a design for this, and we'll talk about that more in just a minute. Next slide. There's many areas in the downtown historic district areas that flood uh, during events, even small rain events, uh, particularly on Front Avenue, which, as we were just discussing earlier, is kind of a high traffic um, uptown area that is likely going to to see a lot of uh, tourism and new traffic. So these areas need to be addressed with the flooding and the parking spaces as, as well as undersized infrastructure to handle the combined sewer. This project is actually under current design by us. Next project. Lindsay Drive slope failure is a project that's been identified for a while, um, looking at some external funding for this project, um, it is it's out um, over on the east side of town near Carver High School, and the slope is continually failing. Um, we have a design build contractor selected, and we are working on getting them under contract and just need to secure the funding. Next project. Excuse me, please. Um, yes, I don't know if other people are having the same problem I am, but I'm not. the The slides are not moving. Okay. Uh, they are for me. I don't know if others are having the problem you're having, Councilor Thomas. Well, I'm, I'm watching me. it. I'm watching it on the CCG TV, and it still shows the. Um, Ah, it's yeah. moving for me. Yeah, I think it's it's probably delayed on TV. Well, it was way behind. Oh, <laughs> it's, okay. it's, good, it's good now. Okay, all right. Thanks. Thanks. This project is along the river walk on the north side of town at 23rd Street. Um, you can see the photo on the left is from last May of 2019. And the photo on the right is current uh, this month. Um, this happened with the last flood event, and the slope is sloughing off and will continually get worse until it undermines the river wall. Uh, this, this design is, uh, is also complete and ready for construction. Next slide. This is a project that is related to a TIA project out on Buena Vista Road with the Divergent Diamond um, improvements. And the city caught this line during the review process, and uh, TIA had not addressed. This is a culvert that crosses under the road. These corrugated metal pipes tend to corrode at the invert, and uh, that's what's happened to these, and the head wall is cracked. And um, we approached Tia with this situation, and they noted that it was too late in the process for them to address under their contract, but they did note that they would provide funding to the city after the fact for the city to do a standalone project to make these improvements. The concern here is that they make the roadway improvements, and then these culverts fail and compromise the road after the improvements. Next slide. This is this is out on College Drive, um, across the street from CSU, uh, up near the airport, and uh, there's detention ponds that cross under the road, and they're undersized, and there's uh, they discharge into an open creek channel that run behind a residential neighborhood, and the the flume has been washed out. And there's a, a swimming pool adjacent to this property that will likely be compromised if there's further erosion. Next slide. This was fairly recently, a couple months ago, out on Broadway and 14th Street. 
sinkhole at Tesis. Um, the manhole had a void in the invert, and there's soil loss up to the surface, and it creates these sinkholes, and the mast arm for the traffic signal light um, was compromised in this particular instance. Um, we have a design complete for this as well. Next slide. These are general examples. We have a project, Contract 5, where there are pipe rehabilitations and replacements identified. Many of these related to the corrugated metal pipes. Um, like I said, there's a lifespan of those, and, and we have the, the infrastructure in the city has reached that lifespan, and we're starting to see these fail more and more in the recent past um, due to corrosion and Next slide, please. Once, once the, uh, the pipes fail, it, it pulls dirt from outside the pipe into the pipe, washes it downstream, and creates sink, sinkholes at the surface. Um, many of these are around the city, um, and Public Works addresses them best they can. But um, as the infrastructure continues to fail, the situation just gets worse. Next slide. This is an example out on Calumet Road. It is actually currently under construction. Um, it wasn't due to a corrosion issue. It was a, a failed culvert, concrete culvert um, collapse in the road. Uh, but this has been redesigned and is currently under construction. This list here is is basically an expanded list from the, the first color-coded list that we showed. Um, the red is all the projects graded F, uh, and it works down the list. You can see the column uh, named construction cost estimate. That was the cost estimate that was generated at the time the particular project was designed, which could have been up to six years ago. The second column brings those dollars to current 2020 dollars uh, with just a, an inflation of 4%. And you can see that total uh, second column is, is $20.5 million. Those are, those are the projects that have been identified, many of them designed, but just need funding for construction. Um, and, and the third column is, is an extrapolation of those dollars to 2025. Just noting that uh, you know, the longer we wait, the more it costs, um, and the more that these projects will degrade into a, a more immediate need. Um, and then the project status column, you can see whether we have a proposal for the design, design complete, design underway, or, or just a change order needed. You can also note uh, the two Red F items at at the below are projects that have been identified, but will be allocated with other source funding. Um, 19th Street flood abatement and Lindsay Drive that we saw previously. Next slide. So David, David. yeah. So so the, the the point of the this presentation is the number one kind of. Uh, make sure everybody's aware of, of what is occurring, and this is not just a Columbus issue. This is a nationwide infrastructure um, issue where we had the boom of all the towns in, in the United States, and those pipes, you know, got everything got developed, and the pipes got put in the ground, and many of these pipes either had a 25 to 50 year uh, life expectancy, and um, like many cities all over the country is they are well beyond those lifespans. And what we're seeing now is a, is the failure rate going up. And I've, I've been working with uh, CCG for about 15 years, being all stormwater, you know, uh, consultant on designs. And what I've been seeing personally is probably in the last four to five years, I've been, I've been seeing the rate of failures go up more so than I had 10 years prior. Um, and so as 
you know, the city with Don, with uh, working with uh, Miss Donna and Miss Pam, you know, we've been been diligent on a, a, when the issue gets identified, we go look at it, we find out what the issue is, we come up with it, a design, but the hindrance um, is the funding is the biggest issue. Um, as you can see in this table here, in the last six years, we've spent close to $5 million on those uh, repair projects or replacement projects. Um, but also in those same six years, $20 million of projects have been identified as being issues. Um, now, what I will say is the projects that you saw that were red and orange, okay, that was the D's and the F's, that's seven million dollars. Those are ones that are imminent. Something needs to get done on those very quickly, or there's going to be impacts to having to close down the river walk, for example, or you know roads being have to be shut down because of failures and sinkholes getting developed in the roads. Um, but the same thing that Scott mentioned, if you add in the seas, which are very close, and when I say close. Um, um, Maybe the only reason they didn't fall in that D and F category is because um, the safety aspect probably wasn't as large because it was in a residential area versus a commercial area. Um, but if those are get if those get pushed out too far, those become D's and F's. And like anything, when you get emergency work, you know, and obviously the cost of those products go through the roof um, to deal with those. So. What I came to um, meet with uh, Ms. Pam Hodge and uh, city manager and Ms. Donna on was I just see a trend of projects getting identified more so than funding that is available to address those. And so I had a meeting with them and they felt like that it was a good thing, good idea to come and present this to uh, the mayor and city council to make everyone aware we're seeing out there. And uh, if there's, you know, potentially uh, ways to provide funding for these projects, because I don't see them getting any better uh, because of how much infrastructure we that you have in the ground, and um, and the rates that they have been failing, and obviously we've had a, a lot of couple of wet years that has definitely uh, made those problems even worse. So, city manager, I'll. I'll or, or Pam, I'll turn it back to you guys. If there's any questions for us, we'll definitely take those and answer those in any manner. Uh, but that's what we want to present to you today. Uh, thank you, um, uh, David and Scott and uh, Mayor and Council. I, uh, when this was brought to me, I thought I needed to share it with you and um, and the public. Uh, and to make the point that we have more challenges with infrastructure, uh, more projects, obviously, than money. And we have got to uh, put our heads together and figure out uh, how do we get out front of these storm water challenges um, and um, protect our assets, our infrastructure. And so um, we don't have answers for you today. And I know you don't have answers. You probably have questions. And we'll try and answer those. But I think we've got to look for solutions for answers together. Uh, and so Deputy City Manager Hodge, I don't know if you have any comments. Yes, just to add to um, the presentation, we receive funding from OLOST as well as uh, stormwater millage in order to fund stormwater projects. In the upcoming budget, FY21, the allocation for stormwater is 600000 from OLOST and almost $1.4 million from the stormwater millage for a total of $2 million, which is approximately what we receive each year in order to address stormwater projects, which is not going to provide the funding necessary to address the projects that we have identified currently and then moving forward. Uh, we will be able to take care of the uh, first project on the list, which is the Riverwalk um, project right behind the Synovus building. Um, we'll be able to handle that project as well as the Winton Road uh, wall project. 
Uh, but then moving into next fiscal year, we'll be able to do one project that's on this list uh, to address those concerns. So funding is an issue, and we will be uh, coming back with some um, options for council to consider on how to fund stormwater moving forward. Well, and uh, Deputy City Manager Hodge, to, to make a point, I, I'd ask that David or Scott put the PowerPoint back up. You said we would be able to handle, show them the projects we will handle, but then I want you to then point to the projects we will not handle because we don't have money and show to show the severity of, of those things we will not handle because we don't have money. So can you put those back up to show what we will, we anticipate we can handle with funding that we have identified and then the critical ones that we can't handle that need, need to be handled now and they're F projects or D projects. Yes, Jeremy, can you put the presentation back up? And move to the very end, slide 17. Well, I want, I want yeah, I want photos, yeah. Okay, I so want. this project here, um, go back, Jeremy, one slide. The, go back the other way. Just give me the name. Um, hold on. Could be the it gravy be, in the basket. Yes, it would be slide. The very first, slide very first five. photo. Yeah, very first photo. Good slide. Okay, so go. slide five. So this is the um, Riverwalk project right behind the Synovus building. This project will be able to fund uh, and move forward with this project being the one that's the highest priority. Uh, we'll also be able to sl uh, fund slide seven, which is the Winton Road wall project. This project will be um, able to fund and then go back to uh, or go to slide um, 10, uh, we'll be able to address the Riverwalk project um, in FY21. Those are the ones that we can fund uh, currently with the allocation that we received in FY20 and then FY21. Uh, those would be the projects. Now, there is funding for uh, the 19th Street flood abatement. That's been a project that's ongoing. We're waiting on the final easement to move forward with that. So that project had been funded already in the past. Uh, the Lindsay Drive project is a, a GEMA project, so that one is, is funding been identified through GEMA. Uh, but those are the projects that we will be able to fund uh, through FY21. Um, so um, if any additional, um, you know, I, I, wear and tear on the, these projects. I want you to show the actual ones we will not fund, the, 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 the slide. Okay, so go to slide. And, and uh, City Manager, I, I will, while they're looking for that, is there, there are several projects listed here that we don't have photos of because there are more internal failures that will eventually show itself to sure. the surface <laughs> eventually. So some of those aren't listed, but I will, we don't have photos exactly of those, but... And I'm asking so that, you know, if someone calls to report or that there, it's not a surprise, we know that that project exists. So I need you to show the slide for those that you have. Okay. Okay. So if you start on slide 11, Jeremy, that says uh, Buena Vista Road Drainage, uh, this one is not, we do not have funding identified to this one and just moving forward. Um, to the next slide, this uh, project does not have funding identified or available. Uh, next slide, uh, the Broadway at 14th Street Manhole, um, this it does not currently have funding uh, available. Uh, next slide, uh, addressing any of the pipe failures, um, we'll be able to um, handle if there's a, a collapse or something that we need to address. We're not going to obviously spend every uh, penny that's been allocated to handle any emergency that comes up. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
you know, sinkholes will be able to address. And, and Donna, if you want to add in um, any information, uh, please feel free. Next slide. Uh, this project at Calumet is under construction. This is a funded project, uh, and that one is moving forward. Next slide. Can and I make a comment about like, Calumet? Go ahead. Um, we do have a contractor under contract, and we also have the bridge, the replacement bridge that has already been ordered and delivered to the contractor. The delay, current delay, is um, Pratt Whitney has a major fiber optic line that runs through the construction area that they haven't been able to identify the location. So we have a meeting with them on Friday to see if they've made any progress toward that or how we might be able to proceed cautiously, of course, um, trying to locate that line and get the construction moving forward. Okay. And so if you'll go back, Jeremy, to the slide, uh, yeah, that one. Okay. So those things that we will not be able to do, how much, what's the total cost for those that we're not able to do and just the ones that you showed, the, the Fs and the Ds? Uh, we're probably uh, around $4 million that's in the F or the D that does not have funding identified. Okay, that we would not be able to do, right? That's yes. correct. And, and the, what's the total? None of the Cs. None of the Cs total, would be identified. What's the total of all those that need to be done? Go to the yeah. next slide, Jeremy. So, if you look right here, uh, the the remaining is the twenty million nine uh, mm -hmm. four ninety. So, yeah. what she's what she's mentioning is she has around, uh, Pam, you're saying around two million dollars for this year, and then mm -hmm. what is it for twenty one? Yeah, around two million for twenty one. So we have about four million available. So you would have. You. 16 million still remaining that um, is already identified, not counting anything that we are seeing get identified from this point, you know, forward for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. So to do all of those from all the Fs down through that 1A would be how much? 20, 20 million 490,000. Okay, that we need to be able to do all of those things. Yeah. Is that right, Deputy City Manager Hodge? Yes, that's correct. So we need about 21 to $25 million. That's correct. Yep. And um, for those things we can't do. But let me just make a, a point here, um, j just because we've been talking about the Liberty District, and we're going to talk about that a little later. How much did we spend on the 6th Avenue flood abatement project that came through the Liberty District? 43 million. We spent 43 million on that one project? Yes, sir. And all of these total how much? 20, 20 and a half million. Okay. I just wanted to make that point. So, um, any other questions regarding uh, the stormwater update? Yep. Okay. Mr. City Manager? Yes, sir. Yeah, have we uh, are we staying in contact with our federal representatives about uh, helping us in some of these matters? Uh, I know they talk about these things all the time. I'm just curious to uh, are they putting in a good workforce? Well, um, you know the president talked about infrastructure projects, and um, and and that is still being debated in Congress, and the one position we want it to be in as we show this project, uh, show these projects to you, is that we want shovel-ready projects in the event they come through with infrastructure funds. And so infrastructure is on, funding is on the agenda um, of, uh, in Washington, I, I, I'll, I'll say. So um, I think GMA and ACCG have kind of survey on, you know, infrastructure project needs and, um, and, and, and this should show you that we are 
trying to be forward thinking. We're trying to have shovel ready projects that we can communicate this information to the state or Washington in an instant. And so that's the position we're trying to place ourselves in. Okay, my second question is, and I receive uh, a lot of calls, they ask me with the damage on the river wall, uh, some of the damage that was shown today on these slide presentations, are we, do we receive GEMA money? Do we receive any uh, rehabilitative or reconstruction type funding for this type of damage that occurs quite often, or are we having to handle it within our own funds uh, within our own within the city's budget? Well, we go after GEMA money, and, and if they go back to there was one slide that showed that we were waiting on some GEMA funding. If Jeremy could go back to that slide, but uh, of course, our position. I've talked about in the past. Yes, Mr. City Manager, I will say that we just have completed three slope failure projects um, that was GEMA funded due to the uh, flood that happened uh, a couple of years ago, you know, two or three years ago. And they did fund those due to that particular, you know, uh, flooding event. So this one is now failing similar to the ones that we made the repairs on, um, but it did not occur during a, you know, one catastrophic event that they can tie it to. So I'm not saying that it's not available, but that's how we got the previous ones funded. Well, well, and I, and I want to be so, clear. Are these all separate areas, or are they the, some of these the same areas that have failed? They're all they're all in separate areas. Some separate. was all the way close to the, you know, all the way at um, what park was that? Um, just lost it. Almost down to the south plant, the water waste water plant, Frederick Frederick Park. Park. and then we've had them all the way up to Bulldog Bait and Tackle area, and then we had them. You know, this one's all the way on the north end. The the areas that we fixed in the past, we they haven't been compromised. We're having no problems with those, correct? Correct. We've monitored those since the construction, which they've been built for a little over a year and a half now, and we do not see any negative impacts on those. Good. So, and Councilor Davis, and to to Mayor and Council, and Mayor, you know this, but I just want you to to um, to be assured that when there's an event, we go after FEMA dollars, GEMA dollars, uh, re related to hurricanes and everything else. We always have a team that we. We, we're working, and the mayor mentioned um, about uh, the COVID-19. Uh, uh, we've got a team of the two deputy city managers, the finance director, Robert Frutrell, Homeland Security, with Riley Land, and uh, with our HR director, because we want to cover from personnel expense to every, uh, we're looking at hospitals and um uh, just healthcare. We're, we're looking at every category, trying to assemble any expense that even they expensed that we potentially can be reimbursed on. So that team is working every day, and we do that for every event, whether it's a hurricane, tornado. I mean, a tornado or any other event. I just want you to know that we go after those dollars. So, any other questions on stormwater? If not, I want to thank uh, David Bishop and Scott Thompson with Barge Design Solutions for your work. Um, you have, um, I can't thank them enough, working along with our engineer Donna Newman and Deputy City Manager Pam Hodge. Uh, so thank you, David. Thank you, Scott, for joining us today. And with that, uh, Mayor and Council, we're going to go to my next topic, and that's tax allocation districts all of them, uh, but uh, we're going to talk about all of the tax allocation districts, but we're going to spend a little bit more time on the Liberty District uh, because it's been in conversation here uh, recently um, where there have been questions asked uh, about uh, the Liberty District, um, the Liberty Theater. Uh, there's been questions asked about uh, investment in areas, and so 
Uh, we are even going to talk about investment a little bit at the end of the tax allocation districts um, discussion. And so, Deputy City Manager Hodge, if you will take it from there. Sure. Jeremy, if you can load the tax allocation district update. So I'm just going to go through the um, each of the, the districts, uh, talk about their characteristics. Um, we do have seven tax allocation districts, uh, Fort Benning Technology Park, which is improved in December of 2015, uh, the River District, which has three TADs, approved in March of 16. Um, the Midtown, there was two districts approved in October of 16, and then Midland Commons was our most recent one, uh, and th that was approved in February of 18. Uh, the Fort Benning Technology Park um, is a was approved in December of 15. That was our first one. Uh, developed for a 183-acre business park. Uh, it covers uh, 1,230 acres, uh, contains approximately 3.1 square foot of commercial industrial space. Um, access to U.S. Uh, 520 to Custer Road was developed under the TIA project. That was one of our first uh, TIA projects. Uh, there is a proposed interchange there at I-185 and Casita Oak, Casita Road, which will also help um, access to this particular site. Uh, there's currently no development um, has occurred at this proposed uh, business park. Um, so there's uh, building permits. What we've pulled is the building permit. This does not include any site work, just building permits. In that particular TAD, we've had two. Uh, for eleven thousand dollars, and then two uh, resident or three residential uh, building permits pulled since the TAD was initiated in 2016. Uh, the River District has three separate uh, redevelopment areas uh, that cover 1,975 parcels, 846 acres, uh, approximately just over a thousand existing structures. Um, in the 6th Avenue Liberty District, that encompasses 296 acres, uh, area that's been significant infrastructure improvements, which I will go through. Uh, the major project that took place in the Liberty District uh, contains the Liberty Theater, uh, the jail, South Commons, and several industrial areas. We've had little uh, growth in that particular area. We've had 68 commercial permits pulled for just over $30 million since 2016. And again, these are building permits, uh, not all the site work that goes uh, with a particular project. Out of that $30 million, 15 was the Housing Authorities project, and then Claflin just under uh, $5 million. And we've had eight residential permits pulled since 2016 uh, for $295,000. Uh, the second uh, redevelopment area in the Uptown is the Uptown District, covers 195 acres. Uh, traditional our downtown area of the community and there has been uh, significant investment and improvement in this particular area of our community. Uh, we do have two uh, pending TAD applications uh, for development, uh, one with W.C. Bradley, a total of $167 million development. Uh, there is a TAD application which has been presented to council as well as the Ram Hotel. Uh, at their total um, development is $27.5 million. So, again, significant investment in that uptown district. Uh, building permits since 2016, uh, 97 uh, for $111 million uh, since 2016, and seven uh, residential uh, for $68,000. And then the last in that uh, particular uh, TAD, was the Second Avenue City Village redevelopment that covers 371 acres. A uh, majority of the mills were located uh, in this particular area. 35% of the housing in this particular area is 75 years or older. Uh, includes City Village and the Bibb City area. Um, Bibb Mills and Johnson Mills have both been converted to event center or uh, residential usage. 
and building permits pulled since 2016, 20 uh, commercial building permits for 5.2 million and 25 residential permits for 785,000. Uh, the next was the Midtown East and West, uh, approved in October of 16. Uh, this is the densely developed area in the core of our community. Uh, the, the West uh, TAD is made up of 325 acres. Uh, the East TAD uh, in Midtown is made up of just under 93 acres. So on the Midtown East, uh, we've had 22 uh, commercial building permits pulled for a total value of 4.3 million. And this is the area there close to 185. We've had zero uh, residential permits. In the Midtown West, we've had 40 commercial permits for 13.7 million uh, residential permits, uh, 13 for 105. Uh, Midland Commons, which is the most recent uh, TAD, was done in uh, February of 2018. It's the site of the former Swift Textile um, uh, development. It was 85.39 acres. Its uh, potential is right there by Flat Rock Park. Uh, and road improvements, uh, which you can see, are ongoing now for the J.R. Allen Parkway. Uh, the site was rezoned for a PMUD in 2018. It is currently under development, although we show zero uh, permits. Again, these are building permits, and the work that they're doing out there currently is site. Uh, so we have not received any, uh, issued any building permits for that particular um, TAD at this time. Uh, the balance in the TAD funds, again, the uh, balance in the tax allocation districts would be any increment over where the baseline was set when the TAD was adopted. Uh, so any changes to the digest would, uh, those taxes generated would go into the TAD district. Uh, the Fort Benning Technology Park has $12,000, almost $13,000. Uh, in the River District, the Uptown District, which is where we've seen most of our uh, development, is uh, over a million dollars. City Village, 233,000. Uh, the Liberty District, 26,000. Uh, Midtown East, 23,000. And Midtown West, uh, 369,000. And at this point, we have not uh, received any increment in the Midland Commons uh, TAD. So just specifically looking at the Liberty District, we've had a lot of questions come up about the Liberty District. Uh, there was funding allocated in 1999 uh, through the SPLOST, $5 million uh, utilized to date as just over $3.6 million. Uh, that was used for property acquisition, just under $2 million. Uh, the Ma Rainey re Rehabilitation, $147,000. Uh, there was some additional grant funding, which I'll cover uh, in, in a minute. Uh, the Resting Gardens, also known as the Black Cemetery, 199915 uh, We did some streetscapes in that area out of this SPLOSS dollars, $167,000. Uh, there was a contribution out of the Liberty District um, SPLOSS funding for the flood abatement of, of $644,000. Uh, there was signal and lighting of 291000 and then other expenditures, environmental appraisals, engineering services of $227,000. Uh, the balance in these, uh, this funding is $1.3 million. Of that, 600000 has been committed to the Dragonfly Trail connection, uh, which was presented to council. This would be the connection from MLK and to the river. Uh, so this is just uh, the chart that shows the city-owned property um, in the Liberty District uh, utilizing the uh, SPLOSS funding uh, to purchase. You can see all those highlighted in uh, the lavender color. Uh, the Ma Rainey House, uh, this was uh, the rehabilitation of the Ma Rainey House uh, that was done several years ago. Uh, the Resting Gardens Slave Cemetery, uh, this is what it looked like before. Um, it's just off of 6th Avenue, and you can see there was uh, 
major improvements made to this particular area uh, to honor this location. Uh, other Liberty District investments, uh, as the city manager mentioned earlier, there was significant investment in this particular area for flood abatement, as well as street streetscapes of $43 million. This included the parking lot that's there at 6th Avenue and 9th Street. Uh, we also received a grant uh, for the Ma Rainey House of 149,000 uh, Veterans Parkway streetscapes of $5 million. And then the Dragonfly Trail uh, connection that will be uh, going through the Liberty District of 900,000. And that is currently under design. Uh, these are just some pictures. I always find these pictures fascinating. Uh, this is what's under 6th Avenue. Uh, this is part of the flood abatement project. You can see um, this is what you don't see uh, on 6th Avenue. This is what you see now. Uh, so just know that that is under 6th Avenue when you're driving down uh, that particular area. Well, uh, and, uh, and Deputy City okay. Manager, let, let me just interject to say that we were having serious flooding issues um, in the Liberty District. And this flood abatement project uh, came about uh, to um, not eliminate at 100 percent, but to reduce the flood. And they often would call us from Holsey Chapel Church on 8th and the basement. It, it was all flooded, the Liberty flooded. And, and so we went in and we did this massive flood abatement project that ended up costing us the $43 million that you highlight. And along with what you just showed them that's beneath, uh, below 6th Avenue, the street that you ride on, we streetscaped that street and we put the um, decorative light poles in the middle of the median that you can see there. And uh, the trees are planted and we beautified the area along 6th Avenue. And I just wanted to make that point about the flooding that was occurring, and we went in to uh, help alleviate the flooding issues in the Liberty District. And this, there was also a project uh, that was included just uh, right in front of the Liberty Theater, uh, kind of a before and after uh, picture uh, to address uh, issues right in front of the Liberty Theater. Uh, this is the parking lot there that was uh, constructed at 6th and 9th Street. And just some history of the Liberty District. You know, the master plan was adopted in 2003-2004 uh, time period. Uh, the Housing Authority had proposed investment of approximately $33 million in 2012 for the mixed-use housing development uh, parking green space. Uh, at that time, there was uh, significant opposition, uh, which led to the redevelopment of Booker T. Washington on the existing site where you see it today. Um, in 2017, there was a Liberty District Committee uh, that was established. Um, there was five public meetings were held in the district to obtain input from citizens about the future of that area. Council appointed the Citizens Review Committee uh, in 2018, uh, there were eight committee meetings that were held between October of 2018 and October of 2019, uh, and Director Rick Jones has made presentations to Council. We had significant issues with uh, participation uh, in those committee meetings. Um, just to outline some of the infrastructure, which this particular... And, and, let, and let me just intervene in here. I asked uh, Deputy City Manager Hodge to put this slide in place uh, on this presentation because we, you know, I keep hearing all this chatter. And, and I think it's important that I share with the mayor and council and with the, the, the citizens of Columbus where the money is being spent. And so I asked her to put this slide here in um, to, to show exactly that. And so why don't you proceed, Deputy City Manager Hodge? Sure. Um, actually, this 
this is uh, $327 million of infrastructure, which does not include the $43 million. This was actually just the last 10 years, and the $43 million was prior to that. So um, South Columbus, of that $327 million, uh, that is $220 million of infrastructure. North Columbus, uh, just under and, and, 19 and so, million. And so you, if you add the $43 million with it, it's... $263 million. Okay. Uh, East Columbus, $21.8 million. Uh, Uptown West Columbus, $13 million. Uh, the Panhandle, $930,000. And Midtown, uh, $52 million. So, and, so, and so how much is uh, from North Columbus down to Midtown? What is, what's that total? Uh, $107 million. 107 million for North Columbus, East Columbus, Uptown, uh, West Columbus, Panhandle, and Midtown is how much? 107 million. And we've spent 220 million in South Columbus plus the 43 million flood abatement. It's 260. That's Thank you. Um, and I'd also uh, just want to end here with questions uh, to thank also Rick Jones who. Um, you know, was working with me on this presentation, if there's anything he wants to add, uh, as well as Charlotte Davis. Uh, she's been working very hard to produce maps and uh, building permit information, so I appreciate all of her input as well. Pam, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is Mimi. Can we go back to the slides of uh, that shows the properties that the city owns? So you said everything in blue is what we own? Yeah, the the, lav the light purple, oh. lavender color. Yes, Oh, the live. Okay, okay. So right. here you can see the Liberty Theater is kind of right in the middle. We own everything that around right that property. The little, the little brown dot, is that it right there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then everything around it, we owned it? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And everything over here. So okay. uh, this is uh, the public safety building um, that's Where? here. And um, I don't know if you can see my cursor. No, I can't see your cursor. Okay. <laughs> so um, the other whole block that you can see that's highlighted in purple, uh, that's yes. just north of the Liberty Theater, that would be the public safety building. And then just to the left of that is the annex building. Okay. Just to okay. orient you on, on where we're at. Okay. All right. And then, um, all right, I'll just, I'll ask you a lot of, another question, but I'll ask you later in reference to this here, in <laughs> reference to um, the development. Yes, okay. But I'll, I'll call you and then we can just remember to put this aside because I'm going to ask you some questions using this in reference to the Liberty District. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. And it, it was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Manager. Know. Yes, sir. Um, while we're talking on this, it just, uh, I wrote the other day, you know, we've been talking about a lot of stuff down in some of these areas that have been presented today. And I took a little ride and some of those areas and it just kind of occurred to me that that you know there's still some things that i think that we need to accomplish um as far as cleaning up some of the uh some of the derelict properties um so i i mean i i'd like to bring that to the attention of codes inspection or somebody uh down sixth street fifth street there's some places down there that just you know, I just brought the question in my mind, why are they still there? They uh, they really need to be demolished. And, you know, I think a lot of the funds that we talk about, that was the purpose and the intent. So uh, could you get somebody to check on those places and see if we can... Uh, 
continue to to do the good work that's been done down in that area? Absolutely. And, you know, if it's a historic structure, we have challenges, but uh, we will certainly do that. Uh, and I agree with you. And you've talked to me about it before, you know, so I, I know what you're talking about. Well, and you got you actually, Mr. City Manager, to your credit, and I want to thank you. You, I mean, you, I, Councilor Huff knows the places we talked about before. I mean, they, they got on them pretty quick. Matter of fact, one of them was had a lot of uh, asbestos. And it took a while, and it was costly. So, but you did get that done. And I, I think there's some other ones there. They may be just so overgrown in the area that that is kind of kind of off the beaten path. But you know, it just kind of cleaning that area up from an eyesore. There's still a couple of eyesores here and there, and that would be a good thing. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other questions on? Uh TADS, tax allocation districts. Um, if not, Mr. Mayor, we're going to move on to the monthly update from uh, the finance update from our finance director, Angelica Mr. Elliott. City Manager, and I do have a question. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, the um, Generally, the, the rule is, the law is that the school district and the, and the city um, <clears throat> participate in funding of the of the TAD. Um, generally, the school district gets sixty percent of the tax money, and the and the city gets forty percent. My question is: Has the school district agreed to participate in all of the TADs except the Midland Commons TAD? Are they? Is there sixty percent? Yes. Coming that, into the fund? That, that, yes. That, that would be, yes. Yes, that's correct. Except but for it, Midland Commons. But it is not at this point Midland Commons. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. <clears throat> okay, thank you. And, and, and let me just say, too, before I proceed, uh, just to make another point about the Liberty District. And, and I'm sure the mayor's chief of staff is on the, in the meeting, but uh, Mayor's Chief of Staff came to me and wanted to do, when he was President and CEO of Uptown, and wanted to do a tax allocation from Uptown, for Uptown. And I said to him, you know, yeah, I can support doing a tax allocation district for Uptown, but I need you to help with something. And I said, when you do it for Uptown, I need you to figure out how to pay to get a TAD done for the Liberty District area. And I said, you know, and we're going to be all in if you do. And he, I'm sure the Mayor's Chief of Staff is on the phone, but that's how the Liberty District TAD, the consultant and all, got created and paid for because it was paid for through the President and CEO of Uptown because I asked him to. And so I just wanted to make that point. It didn't just come about as a tax allocation district. Uh, it was it came about with the support of Uptown Columbus. Um, and and I, I want to take the opportunity to, to thank him for paying to help get that done. Uh, it didn't come out of Liberty District dollars and or Liberty Theater dollars. It came out of Uptown. And so I, I wanted to make that point of how it became a, a tax allocation district before we leave that uh, tax allocation districts. And so with that, I'm going to call on uh, Finance Director Angelica Alexander um, for her monthly finance update. Angelica, on you. Sorry. Good afternoon, Mr. City Manager. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thanks for the heads up there, Jeremy. Um, I'm hoping that you all can see the monthly finance uh, snapshot that I have up on my screen here. Um, this was um, sent out to 
um, you all via email, and it, it is also posted on the city's um, website under the monthly finance reports. Um, but just starting to the right side of the snapshot, if you're facing the screen here, um, starting with the general fund, um, the general fund is up 8.67%. Um, um, the other local option sales tax fund is up 4.21%. Uh, one thing I'll make mention of as far as the um, percentages here, these are year-to-date totals. So although um, it was reported during the budget review session last week that we were down about 4% um, in our sales tax collections from March of 2020 to March of 2019, year-to-date we are still up 4.21%. Um, we'll obviously continue to, to co closely monitor our um, sales tax collections. Um, we have been looking at um, collections throughout the, the state of Georgia, and um, just some um, just to give you an idea of what other um, municipalities are experiencing in terms of their sales tax um, collections. In Fulton County, which houses several cities in the metro Atlanta area, um, they've seen declines of about 18%. Um, in the Savannah Chatham area, um, they've had declines of about 18%. Uh, Macon Bibb saw declines of about 10%. Augusta Richmond saw declines of about 10%, as well as Athens, uh, Clark County um, saw declines of about 10%. So, um, again, um, our difference for uh, March's collections was only about a 4%. Uh, decline from uh, March of 2019, and again, we'll, we'll co closely monitor that as we proceed on through uh, this fiscal year and into FY21. Um, the stormwater sewer fund is down 6.27%. Um, you'll see here most of the tax-supported um, funds are down, and that is largely due to the change in the motor vehicle at the loan tax. Um, true up, that's rated to, uh, that's, um, due to the title at Valorum change that was effective in July. So it will be down this year for the um, tax-supported funds, and hopefully we'll see that sort of stabilize um, in FY21 when we make those comparisons. The um, paving fund is down 6.12%. Medical center fund down 6.12%. Integrated waste fund is down 0.58%. The emergency telephone fund is up 5.95%. And again, the state took over the collections of uh, the E911 surcharges back in January of 2019. And so we have saw significant improvements to uh, those collections since the state um, took over that function. The Economic Development Authority Fund is down 6.12%. Um, um, the Debt Service Fund is up 50.06%. And that is due to the bond refunding that we had in 2019 and the debt service payments related to that. The uh, transportation fund is up 4.49%. Trade center fund is down 8.21%. And although the, the decline in the trade center revenue is obviously due to events that um, have been placed on hold, the expenditures are down for this fund as well um, at about 10.5%. Uh, so revenues are down, but expenditures are down as well. Uh, the Bull Creek fund, Golf Course Fund is down 11.24%. Um, Oxbow Creek Golf Course um, is down 18.35%. Um, and the Civic Center Fund is down 0.68%. Um, and again, all the revenues are down. They're tied to expenditures, which are uh, down 0.01% as well. Uh, moving further down on the right side of the snapshot into the other local option sales tax public safety summary, um, year to date we've collected about $20.1 um, million in um, revenues uh, for the uh, other local option sales tax fund, uh, the public safety side, uh, which accounts for about 70% of the revenues that we receive from that um, collection. Uh, expenditures are just over $21 million. Um, for uh, year to date for uh, FY 2020. Um, moving down to the infrastructure summary, we've recorded about 8.5 million in total revenue um, on the infrastructure side, which is about 30% of the, of the um, sales tax collections with about 10 million in expenditures year to date. 
Moving over to the left side of the snapshot here, um, just pointing out um, in the general fund, the budget for our revenues for FY20 is about $152.8 million in budgeted revenues that we anticipate to receive in FY20. And year to date, we've collected about $137 million of that, which is roughly 90% of our budget. And this is as of April 2020, we've collected about 90% of our ex expected uh, revenues for the general fund. Uh, moving down to the general fund expenditures, you'll see here that the goal um, as of April 2020 is to be above 16.66%. Uh, um, the departments that are highlighted here in yellow are the ones that uh, be, uh, have exceeded that goal. I'm just starting out with the city attorney's litigation. Um, we're obviously still defending several million in claims with that. The employee benefits uh, overage is due to the annual death benefit and major disability payments that we make. That um, <clears throat> uh, division within itself should, will not be over budget um, as we close out FY20. Um, the real estate uh, department is due to the building maintenance and repairs for Legacy Terrace, but there's also a rental income uh, revenue that we receive um, to offset those expenditures. And then the last department is the Public Defender's Office, and that is due to the monthly contract that we pay to the state for the Public Defender's Office to provide those services to us. This contract is paid um, in advance. So overall, uh, for the month of April, um, the total expenditures for the fund um, cap out at about $118 million, or about 24% um, uh, of the budget that was uh, adopted um, for the fund, uh, which is well above um, our goal. So that, uh, Mr. City Manager, is the um, finance update, and I will be happy to answer any questions from council um, at this time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mayor, council, any questions? Hearing none, uh, Mr. Mayor and council, I've got to apologize. I told you earlier that we would have uh, Deputy City Manager Hodge um, included uh, Mr. Brian Salito from the chamber to talk about investments because that had been questioned as well in the Liberty District about investments. So uh, I'm going to ask Deputy City Manager Hodge to update you uh, or bring on Brian Salito at this time to talk about investments. Okay. Can you all hear me? Hey, Brian, how are you? Hello, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Mr. City Manager. Thank you for the opportunity. I've been uh, watching your meeting now for about three and a half hours. It's been very informative. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Uh, Deputy City Manager Hodge asked me to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the decision factors that uh, developers, decision makers, investors, that are looking to place projects in our community, uh, kind of what what are their uh, what are their factors and, and and the work that we're doing to position Columbus and the region uh, and and the city's opportunities for such investment. Um, I, I like to think of it in really kind of three buckets um, in the work that we're doing: industrial and office type projects, uh, also retail and commercial projects, and uh, the last bucket would be uh, kind of special opportunities, whether that's sports or entertainment. Uh, sometimes that kind of merges into some of the work we've been doing uh, with uh, hotel developments and, uh, and, and other types of specialty uh, commercial. Um, and I just wanted to just spend a second just to kind of uh, give you a glimpse into uh, what these decision makers are, are looking at. And it really depends on uh, the angle that they're taking. You know, does does a real estate solution, is that what's driving the decision? Uh, is it initially data and demographics? Is it the availability of skilled labor? Is it the cost of that labor? 
Those are other things, though. Is it related to access, whether that's highway access or access to infrastructure? You all spent a lot of time this morning talking about infrastructure type projects. Um, some people would mistakenly think that, oh, well, it's all about state and local incentives. Uh, uh, but, but frankly, uh, it, it's not. Uh, those are not really the main drivers of, of decision factors. Um, oftentimes in the, uh, in the industrial space, it's proximity to suppliers. It's proximity to markets. And thus, it's proximity to highway access. But if you're looking more on the uh, commercial uh, and retail side of things, um, uh, what, what we've been focused on is, is these primary job creators in the first bucket. Those are the industrial office, because as we're seeing in this pandemic, without these main drivers of uh, spending in the retail commercial sector, uh, you can have all the greatest retail and commercial in all uh, parts of the city, but without uh, those primary job creators who then have money to spend in the local economy, that's that, that's that ripple effect through the economy that's, that's so important. Um, typically, um, the, the factors on the retail commercial side are, are things like travel patterns and kind of natural boundary areas. Where's the current retail tenant mix? Um, what's the competition look like, uh, not only uh, within the jurisdiction, but outside of it and, and into the region? Travel times start getting into play. And then, you know, existing sites and buildings. So um, really it kind of runs the, the gamut as to, you know, which factor or factors are driving the train, the decision-making train. And, and oftentimes it, it just really depends on what type of industry it is and really what the ultimate goal is. Um, the last thing I'll mention, you know, on the, on the, on the skilled labor side, um, a lot of these uh, searches are being done, uh, and especially in this era that we're living in at the moment, they're being done on the desktop. Uh, they're, they're maybe looking for an available building or available site, or they may be looking at, hey, before we even get into the real estate solution, let's figure out kind of what, what does the... Uh, what does the labor look like? What are the data and demographics? And sometimes those two are, are reversed, but it, uh, it really all depends on, uh, on what, uh, what really is driving uh, the train. So uh, I, I hope that kind of gives you a little bit of insight as it relates to some of the factors uh, that site selection consultants, real estate professionals, companies themselves, uh, or their real estate departments are, are looking at when they're, when they're trying to make decisions. The bottom line is, they want to make, they're in business to make money. And so the, all these factors kind of line up in their business model as it relates to uh, their bottom line. Uh, Mr. Solito, I want to thank you for joining us. And sorry, we kind of forgot about you, that you were hanging out there. But uh, just wanted to share um, from a development authority um, uh, perspective uh, what um, investors are looking for and we you know i think some people think they still want boots on the ground but they can uh pull up um, um zip codes area codes and and they can tell you know what your shopping spending habits are like and and uh and so they know if that's going to be a, a good area for what they're trying to do right location matters certainly so, uh, but Mayor, Council, any questions of Brian Salito? Okay, uh, well, thanks. Brian. Brian. Yes, Mimi. Can you speak a little bit in the role that you, you uh, as the um, chamber or the authority would have in, in helping um, businesses locate or occupy um, property in order to get their development going? Isn't there a process on that? Because a developer can be interested in an area, but they might have to inquire on some of the, the property to buy it. What's the process that goes through that with you? Well, I, I think it all depends on, uh, you know, what the use is, you know, um, is, is, it, is it office industrial? Is it, is it uh, commercial retail? And so we not only, we, we field all sorts of different uh, calls and, uh, and uh, inquiries as it relates to that. And then we are able to uh, kind of, you know, 
vet those projects and try to assist in different ways we can. And it all depends. You know, some of them are more sophisticated than others, and and they kind of know. Uh, the lanes to travel in. Others are, are less sophisticated and needs a little more hand holding and, and assistance in identifying uh, opportunities. On our website, choosecolumbusga.com, we have a, a community assessment tool that uh, has a host of uh, data uh, that's supported by a, a, an entity called Esri. Uh, and and for, for some people that don't have access to those data and de demographics, that are often needed in putting together a business plan so that they can get uh, uh, financing, uh, that, that has been one uh, great area of, uh, of help for those types of projects. But you know, on, on other projects you know, we're, we're seeing and that we're working with, uh, it, it, really, it really runs the gamut as to what type of level and what type of expertise uh, they need uh, in putting together these deals that ultimately turn into projects that are, uh, are announced throughout, throughout our community. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that information. Sorry, well, and Councilor Wilson, to your question too, let me just say that, you know, when I get contacted by a potential investor, uh, I am going to, because Deputy City Manager Hodge represents me on the Development Authority, um, uh, when I get called by a potential investor, I get Deputy City Manager Hodge to contact uh, Brian Toledo at the Chamber and Peter Bowden at the CVB to put together the team, no matter how small or how large that potential investor uh, looking at Columbus uh, would be. Uh, because they have the resources, they have the skills, they do this every day. Uh, they get 0.25 mils from the city of Columbus to do this. And I need them to be involved as a team, CVB, Development Authority, and Pam Hodge. Of course, the mayor's always involved, but, but when an investor calls my office, I'm turning it over to them because that's their expertise. That's what they do. And so I rely on Brian and uh, his team, and he's got the best and brightest man on the Development Authority to get it done. And so I just want you to know that when they contact me, I turn it over to those whose responsibility and the expectation from the city is that go do your thing. And so that's what I do. You're on mute, Councilor Woodson. Councilor Woodson, you've muted. Yes, one moment. I'm a little slow at this. <laughs> um, if they would come to Brian instead of you, or if we went with um, recommend somebody, will Brian do the same process, or what's Brian's process? Well, Brian, I'll let you answer that. Well, well, certainly, uh, as a, as a team, it's it's both ways, and it uh, all depends on uh, what the request is, and uh, if it's something that I need to involve. Uh, Pam or or Isaiah in uh, we're certainly going to do that and uh, you know it's 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 just how that that team structure uh, works and and uh, you know I have colleagues and peers across the state and uh, uh, frankly I wouldn't want to do this job in any other jurisdiction other than Columbus and uh, because of the fact that uh, we have uh, we have a great team and a great system in place uh, that allows for projects to not get mired in a lot of uh, nonsense, frankly, that happens in other places. So, uh, if that answers your question, uh, it's a two-way street, and it, it's a, it's a team. Okay, just wanted to know. Very interesting. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so, Mr. Little, thank you for. Uh, Brian, I have a, a question for you. Sure, Mr. Manager, I have a question for Brian. Sure. Look, uh, we had a lot of conversation on development today and potential development, and I think, Mr. City Manager, you talked about TADs, you brought up all these areas that are available to develop in Columbus. Um, I want to specifically just talk a minute about the Liberty District. Uh, you got an area that probably got the most development incentives of anywhere else in this town. Uh, it would be attractive by far if you base it on that. Brian, when I'm, what I'm interested in, what are you seeing, what kind of interest are you seeing in the Liberty District? And if you are, I mean, if you would talk and expand on that from that standpoint, the, the opportunities, the, uh, 
the uh, 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 I guess uh, possibilities that are there. And then on the flip side, if you're not seeing that kind of interest, what do you think it is that's keeping people from uh, not being interested in developing in the Liberty District? Uh, sure, Councillor Davis. Um, I think um, you know. First of all, uh, my my uh, impressions of the Liberty District is it is a it is a challenging area to develop in because of its uh, of its uh, uh, mix of industrial uh, with residential, but with also some commercial. So so it's kind of a kind of one of those hybrid areas uh, and. Um, it's it's uh, it's I think a challenge. Uh, from uh, obviously you know uh, it's a, it's uh, hasn't had the level of commercial retail investment. You've seen some, but uh, you know to try to bring major residential to that area is is a challenge because you've got uh, you know you've got industrial, uh, then you've got uh, you know you've got the jail. That that whole area is 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 going to be kind of hard to do that. Now we did put out a Liberty District RFP, um, and and it was sometime last year. We got very limited response to that. Uh, there was a uh, proposal to do some kind of mixed use in that area, and and that could be a good fit. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, it's going to take uh, somebody who's going to uh, really uh, you know, have the development uh, experience and the acumen and the wherewithal uh, financially to make those types of, of, of projects a reality. I have not, frankly, come across any developers. Uh, and we put that RFP out to a lot of people uh, that uh, that uh, we did, we did we got very limited response in that. Um, you know, in in my opinion, you know, what could work there? I do think some sort of mixed use uh, commercial residential could be uh, a good fit for that area but again it's going to have to be something that's going to be a good blend with the existing uh, companies and and others that are already in that area um, it's it's not a it's not a clean state slate it's 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 typical infield uh, development uh, uh, that is is oftentimes uh, more challenging to pull off Brian, let me just ask you, would you agree that if, if that's the case from that type of development that we're talking about, mixed use and retail and residential and all, wouldn't you agree that if you took a considerable amount of capital in the hundreds of millions and put in that area and developed a solid anchor in that area, don't you think it would have repercussions and uh, igniting an area to, to develop and incentivize uh, developers to come in and, uh, and start making decisions in that area based on having a massive amount of capital that uh, is uh, uh, injected into an area like that? Well, I think if you're asking about a, an infusion of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars on the infrastructure side, Certainly, that is part of it, but I also think having a uh, a catalyst. I don't know if that was your word or not, but but a major a major project that is actually out of the ground in that area could be a signal and a driver for future development. And I I think you know you've seen that in other uh, places. Uh, you know, Columbus is 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 not specific, but. You've seen that in other places in Columbus, uh, where you've had drivers that that have been anchors that have then brought about uh, redevelopment. So I would agree. Yeah, with I think your you know, we got the river, we got uptown, and the river, and the river walk's been a good uh, good anchor on the west side of our of that area down there. I actually look at it as a whole, but on the east side, you really have limited anchors to really. Uh, drive development or to put more uh, people or more purchasing power in an area that would certainly uh, uh, incentivize the opportunity for in investors to come in and uh, put their money there. And I go back to saying with that mix, I mean, you're really talking about a revitalization catalyst. 
and having the right uh, anchor, so to speak, that would uh, that would set that off. You've got so many development incentives. The most of anywhere in Columbus, Georgia, sitting right there. Uh, whether it's from the state, whether it's from the federal government, whether it's from the local municipality, so much opportunity there. Um, I would have to think that that would be like somebody handing you a gift that would restart that plan uh, from a revitalization data standpoint. Well, um, it kind of shut off, so I don't know if they're still talking. Are they still talking there? No, I don't think anybody's speaking now, Councillor. Okay, it looks like it's frozen or something. Councillor Davis, I think your internet, well, I, he's back. Uh, you cut out, Councillor Davis. That's been, that's been uh, happening quite a bit with this, this virtual stuff, but... Um, you need a bag? Brian, did you hear uh, I, I heard you talking about a, a catalyst, and then it kind of froze up on me. Well, I think the point is, and we a lot of us have had conversation. And I know I've I've been a very outspoken proponent of trying to do something. If we do something with the uh, government center, putting one of the components in the Liberty District area, I just think, and I think Councilor Davis was reinforcing to some degree um, what we had been talking about, and that is that you know, it, it's 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 an opportunity to turn a cost into an investment and um, it just makes sense and I think what, what you were saying when uh, when you were talking about um, economic development as a whole uh, just the nature of the beast so to speak was um, was, was reaffirming that because it, it's not just one piece it's got to be the capital infusion it's also got to be a, a pretty good head count and a, a number of people that are going to be a a, a marketable source of, of, uh, of income for people looking at new places to, to develop. So, so I, yeah, I agree and, with what Dr. Davis was saying. Councilor Woodson? Yes, and a lot of that property around there looks like in that map we owned it. So a lot of that, um, if a developer even wanted to come into that area, we have to see how we either sell that property or become a private partner partnership because no one's going to be able to develop or even consider much of that area when we own most of the property. Um, to do a development, Brian, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but to do a, a, a project in the magnitude that you mentioned for mixed use and bringing an anchor in and so forth and so on, you're going to need a lot of land, not the bits and pieces that surrounds it. Am I correct or incorrect? Well, I think it depends on the size and scope and scale of the development, but uh, you're not incorrect uh, because, you know, and you all have touched upon some of it today when talking about uh, right-of-way and parking and, and all of those other things that come with, with development. But to, to Councilor Davis's point and reinforced by the mayor, it's my opinion that without a driver or a catalyst, government center as an example, going into the Liberty District or any other area where you want to see substantial investment in a commercial mixed-use retail type environment uh, or, or even office, uh, I, I would say, uh, you, need, you need something that is going to uh, spur that development uh, and it, it, the wait and see approach we've been waiting and seeing for a long time and, it, and it's not happening. So, so I would just humbly suggest to you that if that is in the realm of something to consider, uh, that it continues to be uh, something that you all discuss and, and think that maybe that is an option that would make uh, sense, that would drive future development in that specific area. Well, I'm interested and in, uh, I'm glad to hear this because I know that the developer that was interesting had a lot of roadblocks in it, um, in that development. And so it's interesting to hear what you have to say today. And I hope that um, they'll come back 
and try or another developer because I, I find it curious um, we have so much development going around the Liberty District and I'm surprised that some of the investors in our own community haven't even thought of, of um, the Liberty District and um, what beneficial it will be to their development or even to the community as it's in a historical district. So I'm interested to continue this conversation at another time. And Glenn, um, you're so smart on this stuff. I would love me, you, and Brian to have a conversation about this because I'm like Isaiah. I hope before I leave this earth, something gets done there. And it's very um, crazy with everything that's been going on. So thank you. It was very informative. I appreciate it. Well, and I'll say, and, and this will be the last point, because I know we need to move on unless there are questions from council, but, and we talked about an anchor and all of that, uh, but the, the thing that's puzzling to me, in a sense, is how can Liberty District be a rock throw from Uptown with all that you heard today in the TADS and Uptown? How can the Liberty District be a rock throw walking distance. You can't play music outside at the River Center or on Broad and not hear it in the Liberty District. How can you have such development, a rock throw walking distance from the Liberty District, but you can't get anyone into the Liberty District? There's a reason for that, and we need to figure out what that reason is, and we need to get beyond the reason. I agree with you. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So with well, that, Mr. Mayor. Jay, I think we probably well, have. If you, go, if, if you go back to what Mr. Salito said in the beginning of what developers, companies, uh, groups are looking for, foot traffic, car traffic, infrastructure on the ground, they want something there solid that, that's going to support their investments you got to have that kind of thing and then once you have that anchor in the right place it's just going to spark plug stuff to just start growing just like happened in uptown that's how you got to make it happen but you got to get that component in there of what developers are looking for i you know to me that's what's missing because like i said earlier you've got you've got the most development incentives Anywhere in this town sitting right in the Liberty District, tons of them, opportunities there. So you got to have something else to add to the equation. It's like a piece of puzzle that you have to put it in the middle. And you fit it there, and then it'll start growing from there, and everything comes together. And then it just starts blending in with the rest of the components you have towards the river, and then you... That's how you grow an area. If you take something and just put it back in the same place, you really don't get anything out of it. But um, I, I think I, I thank you, uh, Mr. Salido, for uh, for entertaining my questions and answering them. I thought that was some good uh, some good points you made. And I just wanted to add to that. That's exactly what happened in Uptown. Let's keep in mind, Uptown was completely dead. Maybe two, three stores were there. Um, an anchor went in. Um, before the anchor came in, um, people got together and started creating um, the Uptown. And the city went in there developing, and then CSU came in. City and Council of Pop Barn. And that's how it, was how it got to where it is. So I think... We're in the right directions. Like Isaiah said, we just got to find out what that problem is. Uh, Mr. Lowe, yeah. thank you, sir, for... <laughs> now, go ahead. I'm just going to remind everybody we got a budget meeting going on That's after right. this. If it's still daylight. Thank you, sir, for, for your time today. And we appreciate all that you do, the Development Authority, the Chamber, for our community, our region. Thank you, Thank sir. you. Good to see you. I appreciate you. All right. Take care. Mr. Mayor, that concludes my agenda. Okay. All right. Any questions or anything else for the city manager? All right. We'll move on to the clerk uh, of council. Madam Clerk. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and council. For the clerk's agenda, we have a resolution to change the time for the regular council meeting of June 9th to 5.30 p.m. 
for the council to hold a special call meeting on June 16th at 9 o'clock a.m. and changing the time of the regular council meeting of June 23rd to 9 o'clock a.m., the June 2nd proclamation session and the June 30th work session would be canceled. Move Just approval. need a motion. Second by Councilor Huff. Motion and a second to approve. Any discussion? Mr. Mayor, I have a yes. question. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Sure. Why are we doing this? This was suggested by the finance director to accommodate the budget review sessions. And the fact that we will be having first reading on taxpayers' bill of rights, as well as the budget ordinances. Um, do we anticipate being back in the um, council chambers by the 1st of June? I don't know if anticipate's the right word. I've, we're very hopeful. We're, we're, we're monitoring it, and if we get, uh, we'll see how it goes at the Civic Center. And uh, and kind of be wa and we are truthfully we're watching the trends and the numbers and if they continue flat and continue to go down then I think there's a good chance we may be back in by June. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have a motion and a second to approve. Thank you. Motion and second. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. council opposed? Okay, it's approved. Next, we have minutes of various boards to be received. All moved, I'll be received. Second. I'll say it. Motion and second to receive the minutes. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Okay, they are, they are approved. Item three are board appointments. We have council appointments that are ready for confirmation. For the Board of Family and Children's Services, we have Ms. Tolua Palua was nominated to serve another term of office. She may be confirmed. Move confirmation. Is there, is there a second? Second. Motion and second to uh, confirm Ms. Pualoa. Uh, any, uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Anybody, aye. Anybody opposed? She's confirmed. And if the council does not have any objections, I will take the Columbus Aquatics Commission nominations together. We have Mr. David Helmick, Mr. Bruce Samuels, Mr. John P. Steed, Ms. Barbara Cummings, we're all nominated to serve another term of office. Dr. Janet, Dr. Second. Janet. Yes. Motion, and second to, motion and second to confirm. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? They're confirmed. Item F, Dr. Janet C. Bussey was nominated to fill a vacant seat. She's ready to be confirmed. Move confirmation. Second. second. Motion second to confirm. All in favor say aye. 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 Any, anybody <coughs> object? She's approved. For the Golf Course Authority, we have the seat of Mr. James B. Houston, Jr. He was nominated to serve another term of office. He may be confirmed. Second. Motion second to confirm Mr. Houston. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? He's confirmed. For the next Columbus Golf Course Authority, Councilors Huff and Garrett are nominating Mr. Richard L. Wright. To serve another term of office. Move approval. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councilor Woodson. We would have to bring this back oh, for vocabulary because Councilor Crabb had nominated Mr. Tommy Nobles. So that's we will right. bring that back at the next meeting for uh, vote tabulation. All right. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, for the Keep Columbus Beautiful Commission, we have the seats of Ms. Sharon Baker and Mr. Kenneth Lure. Uh, both may be confirmed. Move Motion confirmation. Confirm. Second. Motion, motion second to confirm. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? They're confirmed. For the Region 6 Regional Advisory Council for Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, Ms. Annie Davis. And Ms. Cynthia Smith were both nominated to serve another term of office. Move for they a made confirmation. Uh -huh. Second. Motion second to confirm. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Aye. They're, 
they're confirmed. Next, we have council district seat appointments. Any nominations may be confirmed for this meeting. For the Keep Columbus Beautiful Commission, we have the seat of uh, Warren Wagner. This is a district five representative. We have, I'm sorry. We, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have a nominee. This is Council Crabs' nomination. And he doesn't right. want to. He doesn't want to serve. He resigned. Next, we have council appointments. Any nominations will be listed for the next meeting. For the Commission on International Relations and Cultural Liaison Encounters, we have one vacant seat that's open for nominations. For the Keep Columbus Beautiful Commission, the at-large members, we have Larry Derby, Ashley Lee, and Courtney Laughlin. Um, all three, um, all three seats are open for nominations. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right, thanks. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Anybody else have anything that needs to come before any of the staff or any of the council? All right, uh, we will have a budget. Uh, the budget chair has asked me to announce that the budget review committee will begin to meet in uh, 20 minutes. So we'll say just uh, a little bit after 1 third. Mr. Mayor, yes. Mr. Mayor, excuse me. I, I do see where Ms. Elamine is waiting in the lobby. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I couldn't see her in the audience. For three minutes. Yes. So if you would, Jeremy, if you Mayor, I, uh, I have a matter for city manager. Okay, well, she go ahead and put it in the uh, referral, but Mr. City Manager, uh, I've called this in a few times. Um, we've got somewhat of a problem at the J.R. Allen overpass at River Road on the northeast corner. It just seems to be an issue with, uh, number one, you got a lot of trees dying, which I question if you know, there may be a, a reason for that happening right there, but there's a tremendous amount of garbage and waste sitting up on the corner at the overpass that just something needs to be done about that. Uh, can you have somebody to go out there and look into that and make sure it's all cleaned up? Certainly, yes. On the northeast of Dale Allen overpass, that goes over River Road. Got it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Any other questions of the city manager or anybody else? All right, Jeremy, if you would allow Miss Elamine back in. Right, she Hello. should be good. Miss Elamine? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but cannot see you. I hope you're, I apologize. There you are. All well, right. You're looking great, Mr. Mayor. Well, uh, well, Mr. Mayor, I can do this in less than two minutes. Okay. Uh, well, you in, just... the, in, in the interest of time, I will call Alexis to get that meeting with you. We can do okay. a phone meeting or a Zoom meeting. We'll and I will call the clerk of council to get the contact information for counselors in District 2, 5, 6, 8, and 9, because I want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. And I want to ask the clerk of council to be sure to give Mr. Scott the document that preceded my appearance uh, before council, which is about the Snarl campaign. The Snarl campaign is to save now and repair the Liberty Theater. What just ha happened was a complete obliteration of the jewel in the Liberty District, which is the Liberty Theater. The emergency that we're dealing with is that the roof is caving in. Nothing was said about that, Mr. City Manager. And the reason why there are problems in getting the Liberty District done, because it is the black historic district and the legacy of slavery and lynchings and all the stuff that Columbus is known for shows itself in the structural racism in this community, which is why I say reparations 
with no strings attached to repair the Liberty Theater. And I'll be in touch with the other council members who make up the white majority. Thank you, Ms. Elamine. Are we clear? Are we clear? Yes, ma'am. I look forward to hearing from you. I'll be talking to Alexis about getting up with you. That'll Thank work. you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Jeremy, you want to escort Miss Elamine to the lobby? Tracy Thank Sayers you. is now exiting. All right. I will entertain a motion to adjourn, and we will reconvene uh, now at uh, 135. Motion to adjourn. Second. second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? We'll see you all in about 20 minutes.